All right. So welcome everyone. This is the, my name is Christine Berthe. I am the co-chair with Del Corvino of the Transportation Planning Committee of Community Board 4. This is uh, Wednesday, December 21st, and we are um, online, as you can see, because of an order, an executive order of uh, the mayor. And um, we are recording this meeting. It will be available on a video on YouTube, probably tonight. And um, we have a heavy agenda. I'd like to introduce before we start my co-chair uh, co and members. But before we start, really, I like Janine. Are you are you there? Can you sh can you? Uh, yeah, I'm um, here. Right. So I'd like everyone uh, on the board to really uh, give credit to Janine for a fantastic job she's doing the whole year and preparing all these agendas and organizing the meetings and, you know, finding the uh, letters and sending tons of letters. I mean, it, it, this is just an enormous amount of work. Uh, behind the scenes and Janine is doing it with a lot of professionalism and very nicely. So bravo Janine, thank you so much for, uh, thank you. <laughs> for your support and for working with us. And we really enjoy, uh, appreciate that. Thank you, Janine. Yes. We, so, are a, we are a sometimes messy committee, but we're always <laughs> run smoothly by Janine. <laughs> <laughs> always with good intentions, right? <laughs> So we have here, maybe I'll go through uh, the names which are on the committee since there are so many people here. Brett Furfer is on the Transportation Committee, David Warren on the Transportation Committee, Gwen Billig on the Transportation Committee, uh, Charles, Charlie Todd, Carl Wilson, Blake Carusu, uh, Jesse Greenwald and Alan Oster are all member of the committee. And, and we have a quorum so we can vote. One more uh, information is that as we, uh, we make, this committee makes recommendations and the recommendations do go to the full board, which will be when, Janine? This is... In it'll be the first Wednesday uh, of the month. I believe it'll be the fourth. Yes, January 4th. Yeah, January 4th. And the letters are really voted on and sent out from uh, January 4th. Oh, we have a new member, Viren uh, Brambat, just uh, uh, joined us. So that's the process. This is this, what we do is a recommendation and then it goes to the full board. So we have a very uh, exciting agenda. Obviously we have 60 people attending, so it must be exciting. Oh, 82 now. So it must be really exciting. Uh, and the first uh, item is a presentation by the MTA on the, the launch of the community construction coordination for 28th Street substation projects. So uh, I'm turning it over to uh, the MTA. Thank you, Christine. Um, Ernest Matarelli, Assistant Director of Government Community Affairs for the MTA. Oh, just one, one more thing. Colleen Chattagun from the Department of Transportation uh, just joined us and I, I would do the same and thank Colleen for all the help she gives us during the whole year. And she's really very vigilant and very uh, dig <laughs> diligent into uh, supporting this committee. Thank you, Colleen. You're Thank welcome. You, Anything for you, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm really turning it over to you now. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. I want to second everything you've said about Janine and Colleen. Right. Uh, so there are many members of the MTA here with us today. We're here to present an update on the 28th Street substation project, which you may remember we came a few months ago and there was lots of people who had an interest in this. And they have a long agenda, so for the sake of time, we can get right into it. I'm going to turn it over to Joe O'Donnell, who will uh, lead us through the presentation. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Joe O'Donnell, Director of Government and Community Relations for MTA Construction and Development, the arm of the MTA who will be delivering this project. Uh, many of you know me from past updates on this and other projects going on in the district. I uh, just wanted to say that we're joined by several members of the project management team, the MTA project management team, um, the, uh, the structural 
um, infrastructure group uh, who oversees this project as well as the uh, the contractor and the project team here. So well represented for the project as well as for the board. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through a rehash of what the project is because most of you know this. Uh, it is to deliver a substation, a subsurface substation at West 28th Street between 8th and 9th Avenues. And it will be to deliver more uh, effective and efficient power to the existing ACE line as well as future service. Um, what we're really here to talk to you about today is the fact that the project is moving forward. Uh, we did notify everyone, uh, well, everyone, the community board and stakeholders uh, that the contract was awarded um, in October, at the, at the October MTA board, uh, October 24th, uh, the contractor was given his notice to proceed or their notice to proceed um, and has been advancing preliminary engineering and design uh, to uh, advance our assumptions on this project. They're getting ready to mobilize uh, to effectively have a presence in the community and start work. And that's why we're here today to talk a little bit about what you should expect to see as well as the formulation as Ernest and Christine both mentioned of the construction advisory committee meeting, which will be uh, not only the place or the sole source of truth for information on the project from the MTA to the community, as well as the sounding board for the community and the representatives of the community um, to share with us questions or concerns about what or what may not be working. So can everybody see my screen? Yes. So, as I mentioned, contract was awarded in October. The contractor is a joint venture of Skanska and EJ Electric. Mobilization is anticipated for the week of January 16th. Um, this is for stage one work or phase one work. Phase one work is expected to last approximately three and a half months. Uh, so from uh, the 16th of January to the uh, through the end of uh, April. Milestone one for the project is the completion of all of the surface level work, which will allow us to get out of everybody's way and get below ground. That is anticipated for uh, December of 2024, December 25th right now. So possibly a nice Christmas present for everybody because we will be out of everybody's hair by the 25th. Uh, milestone two is the substantial completion of the entire project. Um, that's all of the outfitting of the substation itself and all of the below ground work. Um, and then punch list items will take us until December of 2025. Uh, this phase one or stage one work, as I mentioned, will be three and a half months. Uh, it is um, going to start on the south side of West 28th Street. It is largely for the uh, the um, relocation of utility work, as well as to install a supportive excavation wall because of the subsurface conditions and the geological conditions here, which is that there's a lot of loose soil, earth and rock. We need to put in a supportive excavation wall, uh, in this case, a secant pile wall that will essentially form a box for us to for, for us to do our work. So that work is going to get going with the start of mobilization on the 16th of January. Um, we will start with the relocation of the utilities. Uh, the major utility there is a water main uh, that will be relocated. And then after that work is done, we will advance to the, um, the supportive excavation wall. Um, as I mentioned, this is the general scope of work and we'll provide this to the board so that you have that uh, as, as well as um, the community can, can refer to it. Um, so that water main relocation and the secant wall excavation uh, will be the crux of the work for stage one. Um, we mentioned coordination. So we are forming uh, as the lessons learned. Just, just, just a yes. second. Can you go back to that? Uh, what is a second wall? Um, so essentially what it is, as I mentioned, is we're going to create a box inside the earth. So what we will do is we'll bring in a drill rig, which will drill holes into the earth. And then we will pour concrete into the holes to essentially stabilize and create four walls uh, for the excavation of the rest of the substation box. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so, uh, sorry, um, onto the coordination aspects of things. One of the things that we learned from other major projects in residential areas um, is that it's necessary to maintain a consistent um, and steady flow of accurate information to keep folks informed. Um, the last thing we want is a game of telephone and, and information 
um, losing the quality or degradation of the quality of information as it gets passed along. So this construction advisory committee meeting uh, committee is going to be launched in January as well in advance of the start of any of this work. And we anticipate this um, this committee being made up of not only the contractor, but us, the MTA as the owner, um, AECOM as the construction manager for the project, GCR, uh, Luke De Palma and Ernest Monterelli, who are on the call, you know, and I also saw Alberto rule down from the uh, from the GCR team. So thank you, Alberto, for joining. Um, so we'll be represented on our side, but we also anticipate there being robust representation from Penn South, who we're going to be, uh, you know, conducting this work in proximity to the co-ops there. Also elected officials and or their representatives. Uh, the community board obviously will have, um, you know, representation on this. Uh, this committee, as well as our agency partners like DOT, hi Colleen, um, and DO, um, uh, DEP in this case, as the two most uh, critical members of our of our agency partners for the coordination of work relative to uh, work hours and uh, noise mitigation. Um, you know, as we uh, effectuate this work. Uh, there will be, as I mentioned, there's going to be excavation here that we're going to have to excavate in order to expose the utilities. We're also going to have to bring in that drill rig in order to put in the secant wall. Um, the contractor, uh, DOT, has provided work stipulations. So the contractor is going to be allowed to work uh, to execute this project um, during the week from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, with noisy work being restricted to um, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, but our anticipation is, is that we'll only be working one shift here. Um, so our goal is to work from seven to four, Monday through Friday, and then get out of everybody's way, put things back together and get out of the way. Um, there may be a one-off instance uh, where we're either in the process, process of installing a secant pile uh, one of these concrete piers, uh, or uh, the concrete itself, which needs to be done, um, needs to completion in order for it to cure properly. Um, so we may have to go past that four o'clock um, work conclusion once in a while. The anticipation is that we won't, but if we do, um, we certainly need to be out of there by six o'clock per our DOT guidelines. Similarly, because we will be doing excavation, um, it is noisier work. Um, so we are not allowed to do that work on the weekends. We do have in our stipulations, a um, the allow we are allowed to work on Saturdays. However, because phase one work will be, um, we'll have some noise associated with it. Um, we are not allowed to do noisy work on Saturday. So we do not anticipate working on Saturdays. Um, some of the other mitigations that we anticipate employing as part of the noise plan here is um, I mentioned that drill rig. One of the reasons why we're using a drill rig for this operation is it's quieter. It's It, it does the work a lot more um, uh, quietly um, than either a pneumatic hammer or of a, a vibratory hammer to install the um, uh, the supportive excavation walls. So in and of itself, we'll execute this work more quietly, uh, but we'll also be employing noise blankets as needed around the work zone itself and around any machinery. If we are, uh, if we find that the, uh, the the machine is still noisy for the area, um, and we are guided in that respect by uh, uh, the DEP guidelines, which state that uh, we need to conduct this work um, in either one of two scenarios and that's either under 75 decibels. Um, so we will have noise monitoring in place to ensure that we don't go over 75 decibels or ambient noise in the area plus five decibels. So if the area on a consistent basis is already louder than 75 decibels, then we're allowed to exceed the existing noise level by five. Um, so that will be our guiding principle as we look to move this work forward. Um, and then we'll we'll get into greater detail about all of this work with the advisory committee uh, once that gets executed in January. Um, obviously, you have my information and, and Ernest's information as well as Luke's. So we'll be your point of contacts for these for this project. And you should work through us with any questions or concerns that you might have. I mentioned we do have the project team on the phone or on the on the video right now, as well as the contractor. Um, so if there were any technical questions, you know, I might employ them or, or ask them to jump in. But that is in a nutshell is, is where we're going, you know, starting off. We're going to walk before we really start to run with this project. Um, and going to start on the south side of the street with this utility work. Um, 
and, and that's it in a nutshell right now, Christine, and, and unless you had any other questions. Uh, not right away. Uh, first, I would like my uh, uh, members to um, raise their hand if they have questions, and then I can ask my questions. We're good? Oh, one hand. Alan. Other oh, comment. There's a few now. Thank you. Okay, um, great. Just a couple of quick ones. Um, will there be a website up, a phone number given? There is there is a website already up for the project and there's a dedicated project email as well, um, which both myself comes to both Ernest and myself. So uh, we constantly monitor that email as well. So we can provide you with that. It's been in past presentations, but we're, we're happy to okay. send that. Uh, Ernest, if you, if while we're dealing with questions here, Ernest can put it in the chat too, um, so that you all have it. If the chat's an option, if not, I'll share it with Janine and she can share it with the committee. Yeah, you can share it to me because we don't uh, we don't have a chat option right now. Okay, okay. great. Uh, one other question: Will you be contacting somebody at Penn South in case you do need to run over four o'clock? Yeah. So if if we do if it if it does come to a situation where we think we're gonna run over over four o'clock, and and again this has happened. You know, we've had situations where maybe a concrete truck was late in getting to the site and needs to, um, you know, disperse its entire load uh, before leaving, and so therefore it may run past. Four o'clock. If we know that, we're gonna give we'll give everybody a heads up in advance. We'll set out an email blast to let them know. Um, and again, we're allowed to go to six, and we don't anticipate having to go to six. But um, if we do, we still have that sort of um, that window at the back end of the the day um, to get everything complete. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Brett. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I would say a, a near unanimous opinion of my neighbors here in Penn South are, are pretty much opposed to this grave concerns about noise in the middle of a very dense residential area. Um, I know this has been presented as a fait accompli pretty much from the outset. It was already a bid. Um, the community board didn't really have public meetings talking about the project um, where the, the comments and opposition to this have been, I think, considered as a possibility, finding some other area to put this in. This really is a very residential area uh, I myself lived at the building that's in this diagram on the lower right hand corner of this, and this is a two year uh, uh, minimum, what was presented, um, if all goes well. Uh, if, if you could just please take a moment to describe a little more the process of the community outreach um, and and just what, what your opinion is of what the local elected officials uh, feelings of this project are? Do you believe that there's there's sign off from the local elected officials and um, and, and 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 just the process for uh, continuing continue with this with this project? Sure. So I guess it's a multi part question. You know, this we've been back and forth with the community, both the, the Penn South management, the community at large, the the um, the, the community board and the elected officials since 2018 on this project. Um, you know, we came out here in 2018 with our intent, you know, to uh, deliver the project in this area. We had identified this location as an ideal location, not only from a constructability uh, standpoint, but also from uh, achieving the project ob uh, objectives, as well as being a location that has the least amount of impacts on the surrounding community. So those, those three boxes were checked back in 2018. Um, and in spite of that, you know, and hearing the opposition from the community and largely from Penn South, who asked us to really go back and redouble our efforts and take a good hard look at where else this could be, we looked at 30 other sites. We did. We, we took two years and we looked at 30 other sites um, and, and evaluated them and again found ourselves coming back here knowing it would not be a popular decision coming back here to this location because again it checked those three boxes it's going to be um, you know it's going to accomplish what we needed to accomplish from an object uh, an operational standpoint from a constructability standpoint there's a there's a great footprint here for us because of the wide nature of the block and because similarly because of that wide the wide nature of this block and the distance from uh, you know the, the, any building or residential uh, commercial or residential building, uh, it, it is the least impactful to the surrounding community. Um, with regard, I don't want to speculate on, you know, the elected officials position on this project. We do know that, again, they implored us to do our due diligence and, and really be sure that this was the best location because of the opposition that they heard and felt as well uh, to this project. So they, you know, I, I wouldn't say they, they understand that it needs to be completed because of what it's designed to achieve as far as quality, 
power to the existing system as well as the future system. So they understand that standpoint, but they really wanted us to be sure that, that, that if we were coming back here, that it needed to be the right location. All right, okay. just, to get, just, just to get a quick last opinion on this before we go on, the idea that this is a least impactful of the surrounding community right in the middle of a residential block, I think that's just, that makes zero sense to me. And I just want to be sure I'm on record as voicing that opinion. Okay. Really noted, Brett, thank you. I, uh, uh, thank you, Brett. Jesse. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Joseph, for, for being here again. I, I know you were here a few months ago. I know you, heard uh, the community's strong opposition to this. I know you heard from some electeds. I mean, I'm just repeating what you just said. And uh, yeah. it, it sounds like between then and now, you went back and took one more hard look to see if there were any other options of where this could go and have come back and still settled on this location. Uh, uh, if we accept that to be true, I am just wondering though, what can you tell us that you have maybe changed about your approach to this location between the last time you presented to us and this time? So if we're still here, what what maybe changes have you have you brought? I mean, you went through the slides about the hours and stuff. I mean, were there are there differences to how you you plan on on spending these two years uh, from the last time you came around, or or no? There's this is just we're left. This is the way to do it. This is the only way to do it, and we're doing it here. Thanks. Well, so so yes um, and no. Yes, we're moving forward here, and that that's the plan as of today. We are the, moving forward. The contractor is still in the process of finalizing. Um, you know, the sequencing, you know, really dotting I's and crossing T's. It is slightly, uh, a slightly different plan than, than we might have envisioned in terms of some of the sequencing of the work, trying to get in and out of here and, and out of, I, I, to use a euphemism, out of your hair, not that I have any, but to get out of your hair more quickly. Um, you know, if you notice when we originally came to the group, uh, it was two years, 24 months of surface level construction. We're starting in January of 22, and the goal is to be out of there by December. Uh, of 24. So we're already under that 24 month <laughs> original guideline based on some of the um, reconsideration that the contractor has done. I mentioned that the contractor is going to ex execute this initial sea camp work, the supportive excavation work, solely using a drill rig. I mean, there will be other uh, equipment uh, as far as a, uh, a dump truck and a payloader and things like that, but they've taken the community um, impacts to the community to heart in how to deliver that uh, the the sea camp pile walls, uh, or uh, rather than using a vibratory hammer or a pneumatic hammer, which is a much noisy operation, they're using a drill rig to deliver this, which also takes into consideration the surrounding community and trying to do this more quietly. So we are, and we will continue along the way. And again, this is part of the process of this community advisory committee meeting, because it's going to be a two-way dialogue as we, you know, advance this project. If something we believe is working, but the community doesn't think it's working, you know, we want to hear from you all and and hear with with the folks in the room who have the power and the authority to, you know, alter the means and methods here. Um, if something's not working, we can, can take a good hard look at it. Great. Th thank you. That was a very helpful answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dale? Joseph, I think you meant to say uh, January 23 as the commencement. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I do. Um, I, and you, your last comment goes to my question, which is about the, the means of construction of the secant wall. So am I to understand that the piles, which could be performed through like driving, like a pile driver, what you call a, a vibratory, <laughs> are being cast in place? Correct, yes. Yeah. So this method is substantially quieter and less and less and and less less of a vibra uh, produces less vibration yep. than the tr the more traditional method. And I assume is it more expensive or less expensive or is it is it a wash? Um, I would defer to the project team on that. Uh, chances are it's probably more expensive, but I don't want to say. I mean, I can find out for you. You know, you, apples to oranges comparison. But no, you're 100 right. Not only is it less noisy from the, you know, the execution of it, but also the vibration which you mentioned, which is not only a consideration for you know impacts to the surrounding buildings, but vibration turns into noise as it travels through structures. So that's another way that the noise is being you know minimized. Right. So, okay. So I just wanted okay. to understand that that was the net effect of this method of construction of the retaining structure. Thank Correct. you. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Dale. David Warren. Hi, um, good evening. Um, 
my question is, I, I'm not concerned about the actual construction. My uh, concern is the noise post-construction when the project is settled. And there's a discrepancy. I hear from some people that this will not affect the community in terms of noise and stuff like that. And I hear from other people that it will. And my concern is what guarantee can you give us that this, that this won't make noise once it's, because, you know, the construction is a finite time. Um, December of 2024, uh, the noise of uh, the construction will stop. But what will happen in 2027, 2028 to these residents? And, you know, this is, um, that's my concern. And that's, I don't know how you could guarantee or if you can guarantee that the noise will stop after construction. Yeah. Well, no, what will well, be the so, effects after? Yeah. So you're 100% right with regard to the finite nature of the construction noise. Obviously, that is going to go away. And um, but once the construction is completed and we turn to operations of this substation, the substation is going to be approximately 50 feet below ground inside a you know an encasement inside of a box. The only identification or the way the only you know telltale signs, if you will, at the surface level um, will be some grading in the sidewalk for air ventilation. Um, so unless you were standing literally on that grate, you wouldn't even know that the substation was below ground and there will be, you know, uh, almost like you would turning on an H H HVAC unit, there would be, you know, the, the air, the exhaust air intake or intake or exhaust would turn on or off. And you might hear that if you were standing literally on the grate or laying on the grate. Um, but that is as the only noise that this piece of equipment or this, this substation is going to produce. Um, we're happy to come back and, you know, if, if posts, construction uh, and take noise readings um, and work with the community if there you know there's questions or concerns post um, operation but um, you know again the MTA is not going anywhere and for, knock on wood I don't think I'm going anywhere so hopefully um, you know should you have concerns in a few years I'll be here to help you address them okay Viren just a very quick question I just could you just recap what noise mitigation measures you'll be taking during construction? So during this phase of the construction, which is what you know we're here to speak about right now. So right now, the first thing we're doing is that we're going to be using this drill rig to effectuate the installation of the C camp piles, which is quieter and less vibratory than other mechanisms. Um, so that's first and foremost. Um, secondarily, we're going to be using noise sound attenuation blankets that we will use around the work zone itself, as well as around the individual pieces of equipment if we need to. Um, um, and that is in order to make sure that we are, um, you know, advancing this work underneath the um, DEP guidelines, which suggest or dictate that we need to keep it under 75 decibels or ambient noise plus five. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a few questions myself. It's like, first, we want to, we appreciate that you have taken in consideration a lot of our comments. So this is really, really appreciated. Uh, clarification, you said you are going to do noisy uh, um, between eight and five. In previous in, um, construction project, we, we have heard people staging, like bringing, uh, bringing trucks, bringing materials, etc., before the uh, noise, before the the time and that was very noisy. So I would want you to uh, consider that. And if people are going to take deliveries, etc. I mean, the noisy uh, work is not just the drilling, it could be the prep work. And we would rather have that start at eight o'clock. Yeah, okay. so yeah, our, our, I guess we, you know, it remains to be seen what the nuisance noises are, and I and I agree there are noises that yeah. are outside of the excavation and things like that, yeah. things that you would normally associate with noise that could be nuisance noises. Um, we're going to be very mindful to remind the contractor. We have toolbox talks on every every Monday before work starts. We're right. going to be remind them that this is a largely residential, if not almost exclusively re exclusively residential area. Okay. So, so they shouldn't be congregating. They shouldn't be coming in early, and you know, I mean, there's we're, we're going to look to reinforce that yeah, and and for, for example in other site we had like you know trucks coming and delivering and being you know so that this is not the contractor but there are other trucks delivering material mm -hmm. and being very noisy so that's that that needs to be taken in account um 
And um, are you going to have a weekly newsletter saying we are this is what we are doing this week and this is noisy and these are the times we are working? So we will establish a newsletter that will give you a sort of a, a construction look ahead. Um, with the, the, Baiting on the frequency. I know. I think the plan right now is to meet with the construction advisory committee, meeting uh, on a monthly basis. Um, but we would, we could every Friday we could send out an email blast yeah. about the work, work coming up ahead, just to give everybody a heads up of where we are and what's coming. Okay, good. And mentioning whether there are noisy activity or not. Correct. And then I noticed that Con Edison was not on your advisory committee. Maybe that would be a good thing because we have had a lot of situations where everything is going fine, except everybody's saying, well, Con Ed just didn't finish something, right? So having Con Ed, and if Con Ed has to do some things and spend the night, you know, covering with plaques, et cetera, that's going to be noisy at night. So yeah. it, it would be good to have Con Ed on, you know, in the, in the advisory and in the team and taken into account in your comments. Yeah, certainly as we advance this project, Con Edison is going to be involved. I mean, we're taking Con Ed's power and stepping it down to a usable level for the system. So they're going to need to make sure that we're doing that properly and the connections are proper. So they, they will definitely be involved. Possibly, I don't know. I see Bob Lago, who is uh, our infrastructure co-business lead. Um, so I don't know if Bob has the ability to speak, but if we could turn on his mic, he might have something to say with regard to Con Ed. But I think oh, in this early um, phase. Okay, so... Um, in terms of uh, two week looks ahead, look aheads, we have the contractor gives us uh, two week look aheads on a revolving week. And uh, what I've done in the past that works out very good is um, you can give me the building superintendent's name and email, and we could email that to them. Yeah, but Roger, person. Robert, the question was, what about Con Ed? I'm getting to Con Ed. Oh, Con okay. Ed to as far as Con Ed is concerned, I met with them last week. And I told them about this project in particular. It is on their radar. Uh, I can call them tomorrow and see if they could be uh, the my contact and see if they could be involved in this on a monthly or at least not for the first six months because they're not going to be needed right away. But tell them we're going to need them to come on once in a while. I have no problem doing that. I mean, they need to be on the team and on the reporting team. So when you are sending an email, you know, every two weeks, it cannot be an email that excludes Conet, right? If there are Conet activities, right. they need to be integrated in the email. Absolutely. Correct. Okay, yeah. got it. All right. And so these were my questions. Um, that's very helpful. Um, There's another hand up, Christine. Uh, uh, what? Um, Bar yeah, Bar I'm, I'm getting oh, to that. I'm <laughs> getting to that. You can you can run your project, and I run my meeting. Okay. <laughs> uh, Viren, you have another question. <laughs> yes, yeah, this is a very quick question. I'm sort of relaying something that came from one of the community members. Um, six trees, six to seven trees that you see around the sort of project site, uh, will they be protected? And that, what are the guarantees that they will not, you know, long they will not have any long term effects? The trees, Whatever. yeah. The trees are in the park. Uh, yeah, so the, the, so we yeah we're not in. There's no anticipated uh, impacts to the public spaces, right. which include the trees. Um, but we will take protection, you know, in consideration to protect right. the trees if we if needed. Um, if we're going to be working proximate to the trees, also as we get you know closer to the sidewalk area, especially on the north side, as we do our excavation on that side, it, you know, we'll take care to monitor any impacts to roots and things of that nature so that it does not impact the ability of the tree to thrive. And That's last right. question is access to sidewalk will be maintained there was, there was throughout the entirety of the construction, we were looking to maintain at least a five foot passageway on both the north and south side. If there is a, a period of time or a phase where we need to close one side, the other side will be open. So there will there won't be an instance where both the north and south side are closed to through traffic, both vehicular or pedestrian. But Joe, if they are closed on one side, are you going to have a pedestrian crossing? We, or a crossing we will have a pedestrian crosser, cross, crossing as well as flaggers to help make sure okay. that they can safely navigate. All right, very good. Thank you. So now we're going to go to the attendees and Janine, can you move the yeah, attendees? I'll bring over Amy, Sean, Arnold and Carrie. Yes. 
Amy, are you there? Can you remove that uh, uh, presentation? Thank you. Sure, I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Joe. Hello? Amy, yes. Okay. We can hear you. Great. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Okay, so a couple of things. One is that um, I'm, I was concerned about the secant pile, which is like a concrete. Um, I thought originally that electromagnetic rays need a metal container. I thought that's what we were doing initially, and that's of a concern to us. Um, and the other thing, the biggest thing is that, you know, this is not just a city block. This is a community, a community of predominant senior members. And, um, you know, you said like, this is a least impact on this community, but according to the community, people here have so many fears about this really disrupting their lives. I mean, seniors tend to be more sensitive. A lot of them have walkers, they have aids, they're walking around, they're, they have wheelchairs, so, um, they meet neighbors, that this is really going to be a major impact on their lives. And we're just very unhappy with it. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Can you uh, answer, Joe, can you answer the second yeah, so the sea camp piles is a supportive excavation. If you envision trying to dig a hole on a beach with loose sand, it's going to continue to fall in on itself. The sea camps are in, in designed to establish a, uh, a solid, you know, perimeter for the building of the substation itself. The sea camp's not the substation. It's just a support of excavation wall. So we can dig that hole to put the substation in um, without it continuing to fall on itself. So it's still going to be in metal. Correct. Yeah. After the second. Okay. Thank you, Amy, for your concern and a good question. Who is the next person? Uh, Sean, or I, I don't see the order in which. Uh, yeah, Sean's next. Okay. Sean Coughlin. Merci, Christine. Uh, just letting folks know. I just came from Councilmember Botcher's caroling event, and I can let everyone know that Community Board 4 Chair Jeffrey LeFrancois is a very enthusiastic singer. Uh, <laughs> So we're grateful for that. Uh, I know there was a question about the local elected officials uh, that you know the MTA wasn't quite able to answer. So I thought I would just add some clarifications there that I was in that 2018 meeting with then Speaker Corey Johnson and then New York City Transit head uh, Andy Byford in which they presented this location as the area and both then Speaker Johnson and then Chief of Staff Eric Botcher said, find another location. This is not where you wanna be. Uh, so not only just as a clarification, did they come back and say this was the best option, we were told that they came back and said this was the only option, that every other of the 30 plus options that they reviewed had some uh, disqualifying factor to it. So not just that this was the best option for them, but that it was the only option for them and that you know the council member and I, along with Assemblymember Gottfried, Assemblymember-elect Simone, and State Senator Hoyleman attended a number of meetings and community events in which we absolutely understood the need for this substation to exist for the future of mass transit and subway in the city, but that you know we really did not believe that this was the only location that it could be in, uh, but we were assured multiple, multiple times by the MTA that in fact it was the only location where it could go. So just given that there were some outstanding questions about the positions of the local elected officials and the communications that existed, I just wanted to hop on and clarify. So thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, Sean. Um, uh, Janine, who was next? Arnold. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, as far as I could tell, this will have no above ground structures, correct? Right. Correct, yeah, sorry, okay. I was just turning off my mic. Okay, when the remember when the 28th Street and other subway stations totally flooded from some uh, hurricane or whatever event, you saw it come down like, a, you know, with the Red Sea coming back after it parted, this is gonna flood into electrical equipment and you're gonna have your whole underground substation flooded with your electrical equipment. So Bob, it's a question here, is it going to be flooded? So we have, obviously, we have substations all over the, the city in the five boroughs. When we build these, we take into consideration a 500-year flood plan uh, and these, these super storms. Um, so they, they're designed in a manner to be able to withstand those storms. I don't know, Bob, if you wanted to go in. Yes, I want to be, how will, this, how will this protect when it really floods? Because 
Uh, we uh, had sorry, no Wait, Bob, Bob Laga I was referring to from our infrastructure okay. group to educate, you know, to speak more articulately on the actual flood mitigation. So we have uh, in-house design guidelines to protect our uh, infrastructure from flooding events. We learned a lot from Superstorm Sandy. So this particular structure is going to be below grade. Yes, it you know, could be vulnerable for flooding, but we put in watertight doors, watertight barriers. We protect our system from floods moving forward. All new systems get protected against storms. Um, this particular site, West 28th Street, again, as Joe said, we protect our storm, our facilities for 500 year plus two, two storm events. Unless there's a, you know, the entire city floods, we should not have a problem with the flooding of the substation. Okay, second okay. question. Um, stepping down from, um, Higher voltage to lower voltage will create uh, heat losses. Um, how will the, and the heat loss has to come someplace? Where will that heat loss be coming? Out of the vents or someplace else? And well, the, about ventilation of the heat generated by the station. Well, uh, uh, again, I'm not an electrical engineer on this, but uh, a lot of the cables come in through a step down transformer and or uh, other sorts of electro electric equipment that has to be used. They're oil cooled or air cooled systems, which would cool down the uh, temperatures in that, uh, in that room. Uh, each room uh, will, the room will probably have a fan associated with it to maintain cooling uh, and airflow through it. Um, but there, we really don't have a lot of issues with- uh, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop it. That heat has to go someplace. Is it going to go to the, are you sending it to the ground? Are you sending it up through the vents? Will the heat be exhausted? I will, I will have to check on that, sir. And I will have to get back to you. I don't have the design in front of me, so I'd have to check. Okay. And part of that question, if it comes through the vent, how much will that raise the temperature coming out of the ground over there? Will it be hot? So that's Again, the second I, part of that question. I would have to, I would have to defer and get back to you on that question. Okay. Thank you. Those are the two questions. Thank you. Who's next? Okay. okay, guys, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I live on 16th Street between 6th and 7th Avenue. I live on a block where there is a power substation generator. So I don't want to burst anybody's bubble here, but it was a four-year project. And I just want to say, and it's a residential block. And I was on the West 16th task force uh, during this project. and spoke weekly with the MTA in regards to the hours that they were working. And I was told there is really nothing that they can do. They start at seven because either they're union workers and that's their hours. I think it was a huge mistake because people should really, you really should start your work at nine o'clock and give people a break so that they aren't woken up to jackhammering uh, for several years. So I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but they might be telling you a couple of years now, but it wound up stretching out being a four-year project of consistent noise. The other issue that we had asked repeatedly, and I'll ask this for 28th Street, was what kind of, and we still don't know in our block with the power substation generator, was there any kind of asbestos or radiation being admitted out of that building because you have a generator there? People were concerned from a health standpoint, long-term, that this could be you know, hazardous to our health. So I, I do ask on behalf of the residents that are gonna have to endure what we had to endure. It was pretty painful. And I don't think that the MTA made any adjustments whatsoever to be considerate of the fact that it was a residential block and they were more considerate of their workers that they, they are on a schedule of like seven to four, which you know I don't appreciate. And I'm sure people on 28th street won't appreciate being woken up on a daily basis for several years at 7 a.m. Some people work night shifts. So we had to acclimate to the MTA the MTA did not have to acclimate to the residents, which I think was very unfair. So I just wanted to put that out there because, you know, okay. uh, Joseph gave a nice presentation 
and that you're going to be quiet. It's not quiet. It, it's well, just not. I, I never said okay. we were going to be quiet, but we're going to look to minimize impacts. I, I don't know if Luke or Bob have any frame of reference to the the um, 16th or 18th Street project that she referenced, but I, you know, I'm not sure which project she's talking about. I was not involved in that, but yeah. I can certainly look into that. But I will say this. The only thing I will say is that you know, we were all also concerned about like how noisy is this generator going to be on living on the block? And I will say that we don't hear a peep from the generator. It what is... I can't. Oh, thanks, Gary. Sorry, I thought you were done. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. What um, I can say, though, Christina, I just wanted to, you know, um, doubt one or two of her points was with regard to um, radiation and asbestos. There's no asbestos. There's no radiation emission uh, as a result of this substation. So. Okay. Uh, Michael Rosen, is that the next person? Janine? Yeah. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to go back to the location. What is it exactly about the 31st Street location that was not being qualified? There's no residence there. It's nothing but a parking lot near the post office. It would seem to be a win-win for all parties concerned. Okay, did you do the, Joe, did you do the study of 31st Street? So we, yeah, we did look at, again, we looked at 30 locations, including 31st Street. Yeah, yeah, but let's, no, let's no, no. zero in 31st Street. This one Street. in particular. Right, 31st Street. The problem with 31st Street, and again, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, but 31st Street was looked at, and because of the fact um, that it does not allow us the foot. We, we would essentially have to build two substations in order would, to accomplish. Go ahead. Right. We would have to build uh, two substations on that street, which then would rip up the entire, that whole block. I mean, it would just be a huge. Exponentially more impactful yeah. to that area. And it's an, it's an area okay. without residents. But Michael, did they, they just give you the answer? Yes, okay. I heard. Um, uh, Janine, can you bring over the next? Um, Lorraine was on. She also had her hand up. Where is Lorraine? Yes. I don't see her. I'm right here. Oh, here you are. Okay, Lorraine. Um, okay. I'd like to voice one more uh, resident who is against the substation, rep representing the continued opposition to this project due to the large over 60 population on the block. We have over 1,000 signatures on our petition. Hoyleman, Botcher, Simone, and the Penn South Board have consistently voiced opposition to this project. The 30 sites that you say were studied, we have never been presented, only two or three of them and the reasons that you can't build there, we have never been presented with the 30 sites, where they were, what the, and the reasons they were rejected. We wanna know that as residents of this block, why these other 30 sites were rejected. Were they rejected because of political reasons? Were they rejected because of commercial entities having more power than residents on our block have? Um, an environmental assessment has not been conducted, only an EDD, which is the lowest study that you can do because the MTA says, oh, that's what New York City requires. We're not going by New York State rules. And, the, and you just said that two substations could be built on 31st Street, just too much more work for you. And it's just, the, the block is gonna get ripped up on 31st. However, our block is gonna get ripped up. Why not just build two substations on 31st Street if that's a possibility? That doesn't seem, that seems like a great possibility, you know, other than build on a residential block. So we would like to know where the, why the 30 sites were rejected. We'd like the list of them. And I also have one more question. Your diagram consistently showed the substation on the north side of 28th Street, but the diagram you just showed about the, the piles and the and the re, rerouting of um, uh, the pipes uh, show the south side of 28th Street. Please explain. Yeah, so to answer your questions, the um, and last, we'll start with the last. I mentioned at the onset of this presentation that we are starting on the south side. I didn't say that this was where the substation was going or this was where we were gonna say. I, was st I stated that for the next three and a half months, this is where we will be. We'll start work on the south side, then we'll transition to the north side. I also did mention the fact that if we were working on the north side and we couldn't maintain a safe five foot lane of passage for pedestrians on the north side, then we would move them to the south side. So obviously indicating that we would be going to the north side, that notwithstanding. The footprint um, is still the north side? No, no, the footprint right oh, you, for the location of it, the final resting yes. place of the substation, yes. 
Okay. And can you tell me, uh, answer my question about when we're going to get the listing of the 30 sites and the reasons so, they were rejected? So we've already provided that and we provided that to the Penn South uh, board. And I believe, I, uh, Christine, I don't know if we provided I don't think we, we, no, we're on a committee yeah, with the Penn South board. Hold on, we, Lauren, Lauren, I, hold on Lauren. one second. Sue, so could you resend that? Yeah, we'll absolutely resend it. And, and we'll and, send it to everyone. Yeah, and we definitely gave it to the Penn South board. So uh, there's no- Yeah, I don't uh, think the community yeah. board got it. I don't but, recall. So we'll send that those, to you for sure. Those 30 sites, the review of those 30 sites was presented to this committee a couple of months back. Right. Well, not all of them. I mean, just high level. So yeah, we'll, we'll get to that, Lauren. This is and, uh, and then my last question of why you why you would choose a very, very highly residential street to break up a street for two to four years and not build two substations on 31st, which is a non-residential street, and tear up that street. You say it's a big deal to tear up the street. So first and foremost, the, the the major problem with 31st Street was the fact that the substation itself, the footprint for the, for a single substation was not going to deliver the power that we need. So therefore, it was going to necessitate, necessitate having to build a second one. If I have to explain to you why doing double the work and double, you know. Well, the, Joe, just, I mean, you know, it. yes, you can you can explain that. So this is this is clear that double work is more expensive. Well, not not only that, but it's just it, it, we're going to be impacting a wider swath 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 of people to effectuate the same work. It does. I mean, it's just. I, I mean, I I don't want to sound dismissive, but it's just illogical to do it twice when you can do it once. Not a wider swath of people's lives, yes. and I just want I want to leave it at that. Not a wider swath of people's everyday lives. For seven, 10 to 11 hours a day. Okay, okay. just All Plus. right, thanks, Lauren. No, I, I, no. I kind of agree with Lauren that you know the the, uh, the 31st Street has very little impact on residents, but I can understand that doing it twice may be way complicated and way expensive. So uh, that kind of makes yeah. sense. Possibly. Complicated, All expensive, right. the whole list. No, we got it. it. We got it. So. The next four is uh, what, Julia? Uh, no, next is Amy and then Vicky. Where is Amy and Vicky? Amy, me? Yeah. Oh, here is Amy, yes. Okay. Um, I know you're considering the expense of building two substations, but have you considered the expense of the lawsuits that will happen from people that get cancer, whether or not it's caused by the radiation, because you they think it is. Um, you see all the lawsuits on TV today for people from Camp Lejeune from 20 years ago. You know you're going to get sued at some point. That's an expense. Why or have you considered that in your decision versus two substations? Yeah, so we've looked at 100 years of subway operation and substations throughout the five boroughs and the lack of impacts to the surrounding community from these substations. And that was part of the, you know, investigative and decision making process in this that was considered. But okay. they're not all in residential areas oh, like this. Oh, well, but they are. are. They're not all, but they there are several. I think the okay. community is more enlightened these days and into lawsuits and that would be an expense versus two substations i just want to know if it was considered that's all okay so i think i think we got an answer and the answer was yes who's next vicky hello um i want to say that penn south is a very special community a model of affordable urban cooperative housing for working and middle class people we should be maintained, preserved, and replicated, not destroyed as the MTA plans to do. An MTA substation on 28th Street between 8th and 9th Avenues will destroy our physical and mental health and be detrimental to the larger Chelsea community who use our senior center and the medical facilities in our buildings and to the multitudes who depend on the soup kitchen at the Church of the Holy Apostles. Close to half of Penn South's approximately 5,000 population are low and moderate income senior citizens. While the pollution, dust, vermin, and long-term relentless noise of construction will affect us all, it will be most dangerous and onerous for us senior citizens. So many of us are retired. 
Many have a variety of ailments, some very severe. And there are those with mobility issues. We are home most of each day. The noise and pollution and dust will literally kill most of us. The MTA has other options, non-residential streets. They have chosen 28th Street because it is convenient. And let's be honest, because we are not among the wealthy of the neighborhood. They don't care about the residents of Penn South or the beautiful grassy areas with foliage, park benches, and wonderful playgrounds. The community board, the city, the state, the MTA should do what is best for the people, what is moral, what is expedient, not what is expedient and injurious to the most vulnerable of its citizens. If this plan goes through, our demise will be on your hands. You must think of another place. What about the abandoned substation on 35th Street, 31st Street? What if it costs more? People are more important than money. Lives are more important than the MTA's convenience. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Who is the next? Bernard. Bernard. We can't hear you, Bernard. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. First thing is, my first question is, the equipment that you're installing is all American made or will it be shipped from overseas? We have had at Penn South delays in many projects because items that were purchased were manufactured overseas and there were great delays in the delivery which extended the construction time on these projects. So my first question to, I guess, Joseph is, where is this equipment coming from in terms of manufacturing? Joe? Yeah, sorry, uh, turn it on my mic. Bob, you wanted to grab, take that yeah, one? Yeah, we have a uh, Buy American clause in the contract that because of the funding on this project, we have to buy our equipment uh, in the United States or have it assembled in the United States. You know, there is a short, there is a material supply chain shortage in the construction industry, as you mentioned. However, you know, our contractor and we are, we know the long lead items. Those orders have been placed already. You know, we're not going to need that equipment for, you know, 16 months uh, once the shell is constructed. So, yeah, for the most part, we're, we're getting ahead, ordering equipment up front and uh, we have a Buy America clause in the contract. Good. My next, my next question is, what is the number of concrete delivery trucks that will be used? And where is their staging area prior to delivery in installing the vault? Uh, do we have numbers on number? Of I concrete? don't have the number of trucks, but um, each pile, each... Uh, uh, caisson that is drilled and emptied out as a whole will have a concrete truck pull up adjacent to it or close to it and dump it directly into the caisson. And where is okay. the staging for those trucks? It would be I within our work. It would, it would be in our work area. It would and be where in our does work, the work area, area extend to? Excuse. Uh, I don't have the map. Uh, we showed the area of work that we were planning to, the area of work that we're allowed to take. Well, that's, you no, know, excuse me, Robert, that's the build area. There needs to be a stage area for the backup of concrete trucks that will be coming in to deliver ready made concrete to the build area. Well, and I'm answer. asking you about the staging area that you've outlined for the delivery of these trucks. Not I would have to going to be delivering it. I would no, have we, to, we're going to have to get the number of the trucks yeah. that will be brought in on a daily basis because, as Bob indicated, right. some will be in the staging area where we're working on the south side of West 28th Street at this juncture during phase one. But if there are others that are queued up waiting to go, I know the contractor has been investigating where we could have other lay down uh, another lay down area. I don't know if that is for queuing up of trucks. So um, Joe, but... uh, it's going to be critical. This is a very good question. Yep. It's going to be critical that you give us a, uh, 
a footprint of where are the, the trucks. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, you know, because they are noisy when they are turning. And that's another source of uh, noise that they're are also able. idling. Yeah, they also, they're and idling. idling. I mean, that's something that is, is a major issue as far as idling. Yeah. And they also create traffic backup while they're staging, waiting to go to the staging area to turning their drums. So yeah, Bernard, we we that was that's a good question, and we need the information. Yeah, so we'll get in con all, the concrete okay. delivery. We can yeah. all review that at the first meeting of the. Uh, 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 and, uh, you know, I think we'll that get it. Okay, anything thing. else, Bernard? Just the fact that those questions very much impact the whole nature of using this site specifically. And you can use as an example the construction that took place on 23rd Street and 8th Avenue, which has closed off portions of the avenue, creating massive traffic delays all the way up the avenue. And this is going to happen again when you close off a portion of the double width 28th Street. And I wanna know what contingency plans you have other than telling me, well, that'll be managed by the traffic people, how we're gonna handle this tremendous backlog in traffic that already exists on 8th Avenue every single day from about three o'clock on all right, so we'll 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 need when when you present the um, the, the the truck alignment. Yeah, we'd yeah. like to see where they are going to be and whether they are going to be on Eighth Avenue and how does that work. You know, we will need a little bit of a traffic analysis sure. here to make it happen, right? Absolutely. So Thank basically, you I'm enough. asking for a, a traffic analysis. That has yeah, yeah, I just, I just mentioned. Yeah, I understand. Thank okay, thank you. I appreciate those all these questions. So, who's next? Next up is I'm sorry, uh, Daniel. Hi, I have two questions. Vicky alluded to it. The first question is why wasn't the substation, the old substation, on 30, 31st Street between Seventh and Eighth Avenue, adequate? It's an old substation building. My second question is more involved. If I look at the MTA website, um, comparing the ridership numbers to pre-pandemic numbers, you're down 30% on this corridor. Over the last year, since lockdown has been released, the numbers have rebounded very slowly. According to the MTA website, you expect ridership to maybe get to pre-pandemic levels in about 10 years. Everything I've heard about the assessment for this power station was done in 2018 or prior. So my question is, is based on capacity utilization, I would assume your power needs are less now. Has there been a reassessment done to see what your current needs are? And the, the person representing the congressman mentioned that all alternatives were looked into and this was the only alternative. I propose that there is one other alternative, that you delay the project until you have a capacity um, shortfall based on the ridership. Personally, I've not ridden the subway in three years. I've lived on 28th Street for over 45 years. My wife bought an e-bike. I have a scooter. I don't plan to use the subway again for a couple of reasons, COVID and concerns for security. So I would ask, has the power assessment been reassessed post-pandemic based on the current utilization levels? Thank you. Bob, do you know about the post-pandemic utilization? I mean, so, I mean, honestly, the, the, the crux of the question anyways is that when, when this was thought out, when our planning folks go into and advance a project, it's it's not for, you know, they, they're looking into the future for, for future needs to begin with. The objective of this project is twofold. And I think I mentioned it earlier is A, it's to address the quality uh, and consistency of power delivery to the existing AC sub, subway state, you know, um, line right now. So it's not only to 
to you know deliver more quality power consistently to the existing ACE so that there aren't issues along that line. It's for those future needs to address any you know uh, increases that we are able to achieve as a result of CBTC uh, and more ridership. So it also we, creates a redundancy to the electrical system in the event we have a substation that goes down one of the other substations can pick up the, they have to be a, a distance between them so that if say one substation goes down for mechanical issues or whatever then the other substation would pick up the load to help you know power the subways this way they don't lose service right so it's, it's some sort of some sense of redundancy built into this into this grid that we have if you will yeah but the redundancy and the capacity was analyzed okay. 2018 or prior has okay. it been reanalyzed? Daniel, I think we got an answer. And for the, the, the other speakers, if a question has been asked and answer, please don't repeat it. We are already at, you know, one hour uh, into more than one hour into the um, meeting. And it, I don't want to curtail any comments. They are all very important, but uh, I'm a little concerned about the timing. So please uh, go ahead. Who's next? Michael? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for the meeting. Um, I don't think this was directly asked or answered. Uh, the abandoned power plant at 31st Street uh, at one of the two prior public meetings we had on Zoom with the MTA, uh, I believe it was you, Joseph. Um, said that actually when that was raised, it said that the MTA had never considered that location. So that is based on that uh, concession, that is not among the 30 sites that were considered. Uh, how can the MTA proceed without even considering a site like that? That's my first question. So I, I, I believe if I recall, I'm not sure which meeting it was in, but I do know that it came up. I believe I recall I needed to get oh, back to you okay. on that or get back to whoever asked the question on that. And and I did. We went and looked back because I wasn't sure that if that specific site or I wasn't sure what substation you were referring to, frankly. And um, yeah, I was told that it was evaluated and I provided a response on that. But I'm happy to provide that to Christine and the board again is in, in you know, again, I don't want to necessarily, sit, you know, relitigate all 30 of okay. these when we're in this right. position. If you could I, also, think, I think we got that, Michael. Can OK, you, if you could further, next? I mean, I'm the yeah. chair right now of the ad hoc committee at Penn South about this substation. So if you could send that to Penn South, Absolutely. I haven't seen it. Um, also, it seems sort of like circular reasoning. I mean, given that people have mentioned all the, you know, people being here 24, 24 seven, a lot of them at home because they're vulnerable, they're elderly, uh, the air uh, pollution, the noise, all of this is pretty self-evident and rodents that are gonna be coming out, there is an impact. And given that it's in a densely residential block, there's clearly gonna be an impact on people. And the person from 16th Street said that for years, people were woken up, that it was very noisy. The MTA just sort of concluded there won't be a significant impact. And therefore on that, based on that conclusion, self-serving conclusion, they then concluded that an environmental impact statement was not required and that only an environment due diligence statement was required. How can you justify saying that there won't be a sufficient impact to trigger the need for an environmental impact statement? So our environmental team, as you mentioned, did the environmental due diligence. And as a result of that environmental due diligence, the conclusion was arrived at based on the criteria and the guidelines that they need to follow that further environmental due diligence or, or further environmental study was not warranted based on the findings of that due diligence. Again, you know, we build these projects all over the city. We build, you know, stations and, and substations. Um, I, I, and again, I think it came up earlier in the conversation and I, I want to reemphasize, I never said that this was going to be quiet. Um, so somebody mentioned that I said that it was going to be quiet. We are going to try to make mitigate 
you know, the noise impacts on the community. There is going to be noise. Uh, there's dust. And we're going to also have, um, you know, dust mitigation that goes with the um, with the screening that goes around the work zones and water misting and and keeping trucks off of the, you know, any dirt areas and things like that. So all of these things do get taken into consideration to minimize the impacts. And no one's saying that it'll be without the impacts, but it's we, we are going to be taking care to minimize the impact. But it, it does okay, seem- Okay, so Michael- Well, well Christina, just, this is a crucial point though, that given the same activity, if something is in a, in a location where there's, let's say, not many people, or where this is in the midst of a densely residential, nor naturally occurring retirement community in Newark, even if it's the same activity, the impact will be much greater. And to then use that comparison and say, therefore, there's not a sufficient impact to trigger an EIS seems sort of flawed reasoning. And then I just make that last point. And then, by the way, this is totally, you mentioned that it's going to be 50 foot deep. All the diagrams up to now said 40 feet deep. So suddenly it got 10 feet deeper. Earlier in tonight's thing, I believe you mentioned it'll be 50, you mentioned 50 feet. So, Michael, do you have a point there or can we... Well, I want to know, is it going to be 50 foot deep? And I also question... Well, it was not a question you asked, was, was it? You already... uh, the question is, is it really going to be suddenly 10 feet deeper? Yeah. But Bob, can you confirm the depth of the substation? Um, I would have to uh, defer to the... I would have to look at the drawings. I don't have them in front of well, me. Well, we'll I would think it's them. about 40 feet below grade. 30 to 40 feet. Okay, so All right, so you'll, you'll send us the information, okay? Yeah. I think we sent All the right. drawings. But, but, I but can it, send Chris, the drawings. Christine, I just, I'm not going to ask any more questions. I just, that question I had, though, was not answered. You cannot, it's apples and oranges, comparing previous substations in totally different kind of locations. So you can't say so again, I, I that think the impact will be comparable. That we have but we, we end up, we have substations in several residential areas. So we do, we're comparing apples to apples. We've, we've built this in residential areas before. Okay. So who is next? Next is Jane and then John. I don't see Jane. Where's Jane? Is Jane coming over? Uh, she's over. Jane Buchanan, you need to unmute. If not, John is the next person after her. So, John. Johnny. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay, hi. Uh, before I begin my remarks or the comments I'd like to make, I got a message from a previous speaker who also lives at Penn, Penn South, as I do, and she said, I wish I could have made the point that the footprint is 27 feet from Building 9 I measured. Building 9 is the building on the north side. Can uh, you talk about that or reply to this uh, 27 feet? Is, that was... Uh, uh, that was presented at the last meeting. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. So you're aware of that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here's my remarks. Uh, I've already spoken at several uh, MTA board meetings, and what I wanted to say was that my neighbors and I oppose this substation, and that it is not a case of NIMBY. We are not wishing this massive project on another residential area. This project must be relocated to a commercial section such as we've talked about, such as the blocks surrounding Penn Station. And when I've spoken before, I mentioned that what I thought would help convince you, the MTA, to relocate the substation. What I mentioned was the fact that Penn South is a North, a naturally occurring retirement community. Over 50% over of residents are senior citizens. I thought it would matter that this massive project would particularly affect an elderly population but it seems that the elderly do not matter to the MTA. There's something called ageism. Is that what's happening here? I also mentioned that there is a United Cerebral Palsy adult residence on the ground floor of the building at 28th and 8th, the north side of, 8, of 28th Street. I thought it would matter that this massive project would particularly affect a community of disabled persons, but it seems that the disabled as well as the frail and elderly do not matter to the MTA. Penn South is a cooperative, a middle income cooperative in a high income area. 
and it's located near Penn Station 34th Street, where powerful real estate interests are flexing their muscles. Somehow, our modest dwelling place of all places was chosen for a massive substation when there are nearby commercial options running along 7th, 8th, and 9th Avenues. I wonder why. Those are my questions. And I also want to say that um, spending all of the money, time, and effort on mitigating the noise and disruption to our lives could be sent over and spent on a 31st Street project. Sometimes people's lives, their mental and emotional health, their physical health are more important than the dollars. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having this meeting and letting us express ourselves. Thank you, Jane. Who's next? John H. And then Julia. Yeah. Where's John? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, this is Julia. Um, there are a lot of different uh, sides to this project, but one side that was mentioned by several people and was kind of dismissed by uh, the MTA person is EMF. The, the gentleman, I don't remember who said that there's not gonna be any EMF radiation coming out of it. It's absolutely not true by virtue of that what, what is being built, there will be a tremendous EMF affecting people, causing cancer. And it's just either that person doesn't know how it works or just saying it just to kind of dismiss us. But it, that, that's how it works. There will be tremendous health impact on people who are elderly and already disabled. And it's for anyone, anyone can get cancer who, is, who will be on the lower floors, closer to it. It definitely should not be built right outside residential buildings. It should be in the commercial area where people don't sleep at least at night there. Because when we sleep at night, we don't want to be blasted by EMFs coming out of the, I already actually contacted, I just recently moving into the, moved into the building on exact that side where this station is going to be built, I contacted the EMF consultant to uh, to explain to me better the possible impact, and there will be impact. And I knew that before even talking to them. Just to say that there's not going to be any EMF that's going to be safe, it's not true at all. Okay. It's going to be a lot of health issues for a lot of people. Okay. So thank you, Julia, for this testimony. I think we covered that at the last meeting. So we are just going to move on. Who's next? Um, I think that's it. I don't see John anymore and there's no okay. more hand. All right. So a lot of very, very good comments and a lot of anxiety. And I think, uh, you know, I hope the MTA is going to take all of those in account. For sure, we have, we have, do we have a list? Uh, did we make a list of the things that you're going to send to us? I mean, Ernest, somebody has made a list? Yes, I have a list. Okay, and we'll send it to, um, to the attendees of this meeting. And then um, we are going to recap the, uh, the points we made and we are going to put that in the letter and the point where, you know, the noise at 7 a.m., um, and then the 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 the, um, the traffic and the uh, cement truck and idling, which are all kind of new issues, and, and then um, uh, uh, you know talk about the the, the newsletter and the participation <laughs> of Con Edison uh, website and the contacts, and we'll put all of that in the letter if this is okay to everybody and uh, do, can somebody make a motion about that? Sorry, just to add, I would yes. say that in general, we're pleased that the MTA is going forward with a, um, with a uh, building system for the enclosure that is not pile driven, it's rather uh, cast. Yes, and we are going to do that too. As a noise mitigation measure. And also the questions that Bernard raised were principally about well, among others, but the ones about the queuing of the concrete trucks. That's what, I, yeah, I said that. Okay, yeah. I, we got it. It wasn't so much staging he was interested in, it was queuing. Yeah. Uh, all right, all right. 
I think I meant I meant the same thing, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> well, specifically, like where they line up in anticipation of arriving at the job site. Right. 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 That's what I call the staging. <laughs> I think it's more it's more generally referred to among construction crews as queuing. All right. I learned something today. All right. So do we have, a, can somebody make a motion, not one of the chairs? I was hoping to get just kind of one last word and I know it might be a little oh, futile, okay. but- okay. Get it, get it, get it yeah, yeah. before the motion. All right, yeah, and thanks for indulging me my, as I get out of soapbox. I haven't really done this in a while, so. Um, and, you know, poor Ernest, he's been on our side <laughs> of the table, so he probably has a sense of what might be coming. Um, I just, and I know that, you know, sometimes it's a little futile. I remember somebody once from the, um, from the fire department when the EMS situation was coming on 23rd Street and uh, the liaison said something to the effect of, um, we're committed to appreciating your concerns. And that was his way of saying, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. And, you know, we're just gonna write down what you have to say. So I, I think this project has been ramrodded on 28th Street. Um, I think my neighbors are being told to swallow it or choke on it. Um, I think we're given a best case schedule. Um, and I also think that I have a better chance of being elected mayor in 2025 and this project actually finishing that year. Um, the question of where Chuck's will queue, uh, where the, the workers are gonna park their cars when they come to work, cause they're all gonna take the subway, uh, what the impact on local parking, the ability to receive deliveries and other transportation, transportation questions, they don't seem resolved. Um, and the impact on the project in a dense residential block uh, has very likely been greatly understated. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm actually very upset about what feels like an un undemocratic process that's been undertaken. Um, I was really hoping our elected officials can put up a big, bigger fight um, on behalf of the community. Uh, it also seems like the MTA was really the judge and jury on selecting the best site available, uh, including what level of environmental impact study is needed. And we have to take the MTA's word on, on the results of the process. Um, what I'd really like, um, as unrealistic as it might seem at this point, since they're ready to drop that shovel on the ground, um, is that the, the MTA go back and reopen the this, this study search process and make the selection process a more transparent process, uh, use an objective third party rather than their own consultant to evaluate the site and feasibility evaluations, um, really tell us how the value of the, the, the people living there um, is measured in relation to the cost of the projects um, per site. Um, and next time include the community board in the process. Um, so I think that's that's just the last thing I, I wanna say on that matter and we'll go forward and hopefully at least the gravity of the comments that are being heard if this project has to go forward uh, will be will be weighted heavily, especially when we're considering how much representation uh, Penn South has on the, this community committee that's being put together and, um, and and I would also hope that there's some way to make sure that if something really is above and beyond outside of what the MTA said, in terms of schedule, in terms of noise, that there is a way to, to really uh, put a flag on this project, be able to stop it and say what's going wrong and, uh, and not just have this be, well, you guys will adjust, it'll be over by 2026, 2027, and then you can move on with your lives. Thanks, Christine, thanks, Dale. Thank you, Brett. These are very uh, thoughtful uh, words. Um, and we'll incorporate some of them in the letter for sure. Uh, so I still need a, a, a resolution for what we are writing to the MTA to document their com commitments and to document you know, what we've heard and uh, to create a framework for which the, the community can work against. So uh, am I understanding that somebody has a different, uh, a different resolution they want to put forward? I can always take mine. <laughs> Yes. I can give it a, a try, Christine, for the motion. So um, I would motion that we uh, write a letter to the MTA 
that encapsulates a lot of the uh, problems and concerns that we've heard tonight um, and encourage them to make the uh, recommended adjustments to their uh, working group uh, provided by the board uh, that were collected here. Um, and what am I missing? I mean, I think that's what- The, the noise and the hours of operation, et cetera. Yeah, well, yeah, the- uh, All of that right, and the traffic. Collected the, through the list that Dale mentioned earlier. Anybody want to discuss that motion or? Okay, so I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor for that motion? Can we get a second on that one? Christine, I just have a quick question. Um, you heard a lot about the 31st Street substation, the abandoned substation, and that being a potential site. Do we still want MTA to come back to us with that? As sort of whatever the sort of final explanation might be? Yeah, um, that was in our last letter to the MTA. Yes. Um, can, I, can I just jump in for a second that uh, the, the site was originally eliminated because of the cost of rehabilitation that would need to, to be done for that substation. It's like $200 million where the cost of this project is about $80 million. So it significantly increased the cost. And we have an obligation to the public and to the passengers of the MTA to do this uh, within the, the budget that was allocated for this project. Hmm. Okay. So let's uh, let's take a vote on that, and if you, if it doesn't pass, then we'll do a different resolution, right? Well, sorry, can I ask? I mean, yes. will the letter include just our still continued opposition to this being the site, recognizing all of the recognizing that there's not much maybe we can do at this point, but to still have that on record that the community board and our committee uh, is not not satisfied that you know that the, the residents of this community's interests are, have been taken into account over costs uh, in this particular circumstance. Uh, I second that amendment. That was not my, um, okay, that would be an amendment. Was, um, we would need to uh, vote on this amendment first. But the last letter we wrote, we didn't write that community ward was opposed to it. We wrote that the community was opposed to it, which is a subtle difference because this committee was weighting the benefits to the transit riders versus you know, the, the community, which, which has a legitimate concern, but the transit rider too. So I think the last letter we wrote was to highlight that the community was upset about it. And we wanted a bunch of things to happen. So I just, right. just want well, to give you the, con the, the, the context. But at the time, I think we were still waiting for information that, you know, for example, on 31st Street, which we have more information. So the, I, the committee might have more, more to go on to formulate an opinion on the, on the, on the okay. feelings of the site. Okay. David, what are you saying? I'm a little concerned because I hear rumblings that some of the people in Community Board 5 would be okay with having the substation in their area. And now the people, the, our citizens don't want it. I, and I definitely get what you're saying that for the overall subway riders, this is better. But if someone, in, if CB5 is willing to, um, to to do this, why why would we even consider this site when the other, when that community... The people in that community board now this is rumblings so i know this is not official would be willing to have the site so i think that's the direction we should be going in because it's more commercial versus residential okay i'd love to hear mm -hmm. some people's ideas well i mean it has not been a, a practice of our board to ever make a decision Christine, can, I, can i reply Yes. Uh, so our the 30 sites we assessed were both in CP4 and CP5. This is not about which community board would prefer to have this versus not. It's that this site was the only location we came to we came to the conclusion this was the only site that was appropriate for this project. But let me let me also say that from a kind of a history standpoint and, and, and practice standpoint, we typically do not uh, make recommendation for something to go in another community board. 
So we, we would make a recommendation to say, you know, it's good here or it's not good here, but we would not make a recommendation saying, and by the way, put it in CB5. That's not uh, what, what we do between boards that would create friction and we, have, we do not do that. Jesse. Um, you know, I, Christina and I, I hear, you know, the, the, what you are saying about the difference between saying the community is against it versus our board being against it, because certainly our board and our, our committee has a reputation of being reasonable and, and thoughtful in, in our approach. And I, I'm certainly trying to uphold that. I think it goes back to a, a question I think I asked last time, which is, you know, if this, if instead of uh, Penn South, it was a hospital at this location, you know, would it be struck from the list immediately as a possible option and they would be forced into, into finding another place for a substation? And I don't think the answer then was satisfactory. I'm not sure it, it still would be today, meaning that uh, there is technical feasibility to doing it somewhere else. It will cost more, but it is not technically impossible to do it somewhere else. And that is what is causing me concern uh, as reasonably as I can. Um, and again, you know, no one would want this on their block. I understand that there are particular concerns of homebound people in these towers day in and day out. And this is a particularly vulnerable population that I think we as a committee have um, have a responsibility to, to think about and protect. I think just so, um, so I don't know where I am. <laughs> we have I, was, I, we, just we, wanna, we, I just want to say on that point that um, I do I do believe that we have an obligation to, to take into account all the um, the opposition and the, the nature of the opposition. I find some of the opposition um, compelling, not all of it. I find MTA's uh, study diligent in its nature. Um, I find that the MTA's obligation is to deliver a, pro a project that it en enhances our transportation network at a decent price. And that's not just being cheap, that is being a, a fiscally responsible city agency so it's not about like money versus people it's it's more about like is this a greater good given the temporary nature of the disruption and i would weigh in yes and i would also weigh in that the mta's uh change to the way they're building out this project which is less uh disruptive the cast in place caissons versus pile driving is did address a lot of the community concerns. I get it. Nobody wants this on their block, but look around Chelsea. There is construction of all there's infrastructure and construction all over. So it's not like, you know, uh, and, and I do believe that um, the arguments for the uh, that this is a NORC and this has you know they have special considerations are um genuine i just don't feel that this project as in terms of duration time span and level of disruption rises to the level of you know somebody said it was fatal i mean come on uh i, I think those are excellent points dale and i i hear that uh and i, I do think this is difficult the, the other other thing that i'm just thinking of and it's not you know is as you say, you know, they, I, I agree there were uh, some not some compelling points, but there are a lot of compelling points. And the other thing that's in my head is, could they, uh, 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 you know, if, if residents uh, were to to bring, you know, uh, I, you know, I heard a lawsuit being mentioned because we're talking about on the back end, but I'm, I'm thinking on the front end, you know, would they have the possibility of actually bringing a TRO and getting an injunction on this action, which is pretty, you know, which I imagine is pretty rare. Uh, uh, or pretty difficult in the in the MTA's case because of the of what you just described, which is you know the MTA has a citywide obligation, and I, I could see that this being a circumstance where they they could carry the day, and and if, you know I, not that there's a legal analysis that needs to go into this, but I, I just think you know the com uh, uh, the compelling nature of the arguments here is particularly compelling, and it's not. And it, the, main, uh, the, main, uh, the, the, the one that's the most compelling is the fact that Penn South is a Nork for you, right, Jesse? 
Yeah. 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 And I, I agree with you. Um, I will also say, like, as far as the electeds go in the area, let's be frank about this. Penn South is a large voting block, and the electeds have an obligation to maintain their support in in all cases. So I don't, you know, I'm not I'm I'm not obligated to, for the votes of Penn South, but the electeds are. So, so I I would add very good points there. I'm I'm very much with Dale on that, and I would add that. To me, the train has already left the station. Yeah. You know, they have allocated the contract. They have signed a contract. They are signing a contract with the constructor. And in about three weeks, they are going to have people on the ground. So that discussion, had we had that discussion, you know, in six months or nine months ago, I, I could have had a different conclusion. But because it's already done, guys, it's done. And the only thing that is going to stop that is a lawsuit. The community board resolution is not going to stop it. And, and, and so I would rather with the community board resolution use, you know, a, a try to do what we've done in the last resolution where we said, look, you really, really need to take care of noise. And the result of that is that they've changed the technology so that the technology they are going to use is uh, you know is, is less noisy, and they are going to use uh, uh, what is it called uh, blankets for the noise. So these are two very important things, so that it it can be done. And I think when I'm balancing the fact that it's already done versus the transportation benefit of the subway, where we get resiliency and we get speed, I think between those things, you know, to me this is. This, this is a very, very difficult dis, dis decision, but that's the decision to be made, you know? And, and I think that people are very concerned and I would want us to be extremely vigilant on the, uh, on, on the uh, uh, you know, community advisory committee to make sure that there is min absolutely minimal impact. I mean, we need to remember that on, in, in Penn Station, there is a building right now being built at 23rd and, and eight. A very large building above That's ground, which which is actually very noisy, and they're they're starting right. pretty but early. But what I'm saying is that this, every, every this discussion has not taken place for that building, and now on this thing, which has a, a very large benefit for a lot of people, uh, we have that discussion. And so I, you know, when I put everything on the table, I come out personally in favor of 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 just going along because I mean practically we don't have a choice and then right. trying to make a, a bad situation better or good that that is where I personally am in 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 the process yeah so, so Christine I mean I you know I understand I'm, I'm, I'm all the sort of diverse points I think the only thing we can probably do is acknowledge community opposition yes yes I I am we I'm totally in, in favor of that. That's what we did in our last letter. We said, you know, there was a huge opposition and it's it's not going away. And this is why you have to do a certain number of things yeah. to make sure that this huge opposition doesn't convert into lawsuit. And, you know, uh, everybody's on the deck every day uh, with a crisis, yeah. right? So I, I totally agree that we need to, as we did last time, acknowledge that there is a very, very, very strong opposition. And, and by the way, I think our letter did get some results with the yes, change it of did. technology it did. And construction and with the consideration of the 31st Street sites. Right. right. So 31st Street, oh. we, heard, we heard the information. It's, it's extremely expensive and, you know, I don't, I don't know that they are going to change their plan. And again, they have already signed the contract. So, I mean, you know, I think we, we need to do lemonade from a le from lemon situation more than anything else. That's the good use of our influence more than anything else. So Christine, I, I, I second the call uh, resolution with the um, this legal amendment added, meaning the community opposition being acknowledged. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. 
Definitely. And, and I'll circulate the letter to you, all of you. I mean, you know, you know, we are doing that and you can emphasize more on one thing versus another, et cetera, if you think this is not clear enough because, you know, sometimes we don't capture all the... the... Okay, so uh, we have Carl's summary. Uh, we had an amendment to say we oppose or, or are we withdrawing this amendment? I still think I'm going to propose the amendment. All and right. if, it gets, if it gets shot down, it gets shut down. All but right. so I, let's I feel, vote I feel on obligated the to put it out there, sorry. So we have an amendment here that we need to vote on, which says we are opposing this uh, project. So all in favor of the amendment. One, anybody else that I don't see? Right. David Somnik, I can't see you. I don't know whether you are. Brett's I see three up. votes in favor. Okay. Right. This is David. I'm a nay. Okay. So <laughs> we are David not. Lauren's hand is up. So it's three. Yeah. Wait. So this doesn't carry. So now we are voting on the original uh, proposal, which was Carl Wilson. Uh, Carl's proposal at, with adding Viren's comment about, you know, an extensive uh, coverage of the opposition. So all in favor on that? So what do we have? Somebody count is counting? Okay. All right, so this is passing. Um, thank you for all the very meaningful discussion. That's a, that's a tough one. That's not an easy one. It looks like this is today. We're going to have tough ones, right? Thank you so much. And I'm, thinking, I, I'm sorry. Can I just confirm David Solnick's vote? I didn't hear anything. He was nay on the amendment and I believe yes on the main letter. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Correct. Good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, MTA, you know what you have. You have your work cut off. And we're going to uh, really watching this very closely. And we absolutely, absolutely collectively between you and us, make sure that this community doesn't go into a meltdown, which would have major, you know, uh, health impact because of the NORC nature of the community. So I appreciate your efforts on that. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Christine. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody, Thanks, for having right. us and have a, have a happy yes. holiday. You too. Okay, so our second subject, it's now 8.13, is a H HYHK bid proposal to have open more open street on Hudson, Hudson Boulevard. Do we have um, Janine? Do we have Patty? Here is Patty. Hello, everyone. Hello, uh, Patty. So uh, Janine, would you like me to share or do you prefer to share the presentation? Uh, you can share your screen, it's fine. Okay. All right, hi everyone. Um, let me share this presentation, give me a second. Sure. All right, Janine, I'm having trouble. So Janine, go ahead. Yeah, if you could share it and then I'll get started, sorry. I okay, I'll pull it up. Yeah, my computer's not letting me do it. Okay, in the meantime, um, hi everyone. My name is Patricia Baltizos. I'm with the Hudson Yards Health Kitchen Alliance. We're a business improvement district, and um, we are going to be part of the Open Streets program, which is a DOT program in public spaces on streets. Um, we participated last year and the year before. We're looking to do some new locations this year. And so we're looking for some letters of support from the community board and some feedback on our program. So once Janine has the presentation up, I can show you guys some photos. Did you find it, Janine? Um, yeah, I'm just gonna have to, have to download it. It's taking a minute. Um, and it... Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> hi, hi, what are this? What are this? Can you name the streets while we're waiting? Sure. So we're looking to do four streets. It's Hudson Boulevard East between 33rd and 34th, and then Hudson Boulevard East between 34th and 35th, and then Hudson Boulevard West between 35th and 36th, and Hudson Boulevard West between 36th and 37th. Got you. Thanks. 
yeah i have a map at the end which will make this more clear i think um <clears throat> go to the next slide um so we are looking to do what's called limited local access which is sort of the lowest level of open street so you can put up temporary barriers which can be moved if local access vehicles need to go through the street um, parking is also still allowed um we're choosing to do this because uh, we think it's like sort of the lowest barrier to entry and we can still program these streets and still allow uh, cars to move through them. Um, so that's what we're deciding to do. The next slide is showing, this is some of our kids programming from last summer. Um, we did this next to our playground. So it was sort of like a natural um, sort of element. It worked really well. We had lots of kids come and use it. And the next slide, we did lots of kids fitness activities that was really popular. Um, you can see there are still some use of the street by vehicles, but we mostly were able to keep it clear enough for people to do activities and um, be in the open street. The next page shows, this is another partnership with another um, kids activity series. And so here are the streets again. There's two on Hudson Boulevard East and two on Hudson Boulevard West, which are the two small boulevards between 10th and 11th Avenue in our bid. They surround um, Bella Abzug Park, which is the park that we maintain. And the next slide is just, this is a little bit of an easier way to look at the street. So we're doing all the way from the bottom of the park to block four, there'll be some open street next to each of the blocks. So that's that's all yeah, my slides. Can you can you close the uh, right? Okay. So we have a first question from Jesse, or it's an old hand, Jesse. No, it's a new hand. Sorry. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, so th these seem like very reasonable places to do our open streets. Uh, uh, program. Uh, I, I don't know, I'm not very familiar with uh, uh, how residential they are in terms of, I just want to ask, have you heard any any feedback from the community uh, against against this proposal, just just for us to take into account? But otherwise, I mean, the since they literally abut a park and they are quite, they are used for, you know, people are out in the streets using, using the open streets. That's pretty great to see. And I think that's the purpose of the open street program. So yeah we haven't heard any comments there's not really a ton of residential immediately adjacent they're mostly commercial buildings or construction sites at this point in the future it will be residential but um we haven't heard any issues and we do them during the day it's like an hour at a time we don't do any amplified sound so we're pretty considerate in terms of public programming so that people are not disturbed by the kids and the programs great thank you so much Charles. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it's nice to see all the pictures of people out enjoying the open streets. I'm curious um, if what consideration you've had long term of maybe making these streets, you know, slow streets or something a little more permanent than the sort of barricade and asphalt, because um, as uh, as Jesse just said, it's 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 a great spot um, next to the subway exit, and um, it's also I think a road that didn't exist, so maybe cars don't need it that much. So would love to see a more permanent design. Yeah, that's a great question. So we're currently working on shared street designs for two of those locations. And we hope to continue that to all the blocks. Um, but this is a nice layer that's sort of a temporary program from programmatic way to close the street, you know, temporarily. So yes, we want to permanently close them in the future if possible. And we're sort of working towards that goal in tandem with doing this programmatic stuff in the warm months. That's great, thank you. Okay, Viren. Yeah, I think a continuation of the same question that Charlie just asked. Um, towards making it more permanent kind of a place, um, are you proposing sort of changes to the surface um, as one of the sort of things so that it actually can function as a slow street, much more than what it is currently, which is also sort of painted and like funny surface that they typically DOT puts up? And second question is, uh, is there a sort of another consideration for the barriers? Because the barriers Aaron, can you come a little closer to your mic? I have a hard time hearing. Uh, let, let, let me let me repeat. Let me repeat. 
Right. Two, two, two fold question. Number one is um, towards making this open seat more permanent, uh, you might want to consider sort of resurfacing in a sort of more permanent way, some sort of cobblestone or um, something much better than what typically DOT does. That's one recommendation. The second one is uh, the barricades don't typically work very well because NYPD has given barricades a very, very bad name. Um, I would suggest some sort of more creative ways of achieving the same goal. And there are a lot of examples that you know this community board can actually help you with. So with the two shared streets that we're working on, they will be in temporary paint materials. And we chose to do that because the cost is just so much less. Um, and we were able to move forward with that project much faster instead of, you know, taking many years to make that happen. It, we, we took, you know, months to make that happen. So while I would like a permanent solution at this point, we're going with temporary and we hope um, some of these streets. So, so there's probably eight, maybe nine of these sections and maybe some of them can be permanent. Um, but right now, temporary is where we're going. And as for the barriers, yes, we were given those um, ugly police barriers. We bought metal barriers. Um, I hope to do possibly planters or some other type of barrier, but we see this as a pretty flexible program. So moving like 700 pound planters into the street, like for an hour program is a little tough for our maintenance crew. So I've struck a balance with the metal barricades, but we're gonna put covers over them to make them a little bit nicer with like, that'll have signage and talk about the open street. So yeah, we're trying to make it, you know, a better type of program instead of just the blue crappy NYPD barriers. So yeah, I hear your comment. You know, one, one, one quick suggestion um, to that is there are so many businesses- Aaron, I still don't understand you. Sorry, I don't know what's going on. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, one additional suggestion is there are so many businesses uh, in the, you know, around the community, you might get someone to sponsor some of these sort of uh, lightweight, removable barriers. Viren, they have been doing that for two years, right? So you know that. Yeah. Yes. This is not new. They have been doing those uh, open streets for the last two, three years. I'm talking about the planters. Oh, the planters. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm yeah. talking about the planters. I'm talking about the barriers. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that maybe there's a way to sort of find some sponsor who would actually help get those lightweight movable planters that in some places in the city people have been using. Okay. Okay. Dale. Yeah, Dale has a question. Um, generally speaking, this is like, uh, these are great locations for the open street program. It's like, for the most part, it's a single owner of each block because they're large buildings. So that makes it less complicated. And uh, it's park front, but also let's not forget, and we haven't seen the, the pedestrian flow, kind of the normalized pedestrian flow because there are so many construction barriers in the area, but you have two subway stations in those parks. You have the 34th Street entrance and the 35th Street entrance to the Hudson Yards train station. I wanna point out, I don't know what's going on. They recently uh, opened the barricades, opened the street that was barricaded due to construction for the spiral building, which is uh, 10th between a 10th and th the 10th, 34, 35th and Hudson Boulevard East. And I don't know if it's just like the couple of times I was down there, it seems like there's a wind tunnel effect on, 30, on 34th Street right now next to the spiral. And I don't expect the open streets program to mitigate <laughs> that, but I just wanted to raise it since it's, you know, it's adjacent to your- We're your, so concerned that kids are gonna get blown away. And so- We are, we are. Your barricades are gonna go flying. Your, 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 your uh, participants are gonna go. I don't know what's, I don't know if it's like a natural effect now that the building is free and clear of construction. Uh, it's just December and this happens. All right. Seems so they are well noted. Noted. We are, we are. We have to put that in the in the letter. Or but you know the building is built, right? That's another one, right? No, so I know. This is going to be a hard one to modify. Have you, right? have you noticed that, Patty? Yeah, I've noticed that. I think it is seasonal because a lot of the greenery, uh, the leaves have fallen, so you have less of a buffer. But it is just a windy area, and I think. Yeah, we try like the bubble guy. He had a lot of fun sort of with the wind and the kids. So sometimes we try to use it, but most of the time, yeah, it's a bit annoying. It's really windy. 
<laughs> it's funny. So, Carl. Uh, hi, Patty. These uh, thanks for the presentation. I think these make a lot of sense for spots for an open street. I, I was curious what the uh, how the hours of the of these being open streets and um, just curious uh, if you all have any analysis in terms of uh, traffic effects that this has had when you when you conduct the when you when you have these open streets uh, on side streets or other streets uh, that are near. Have you noticed any sort of a negative traffic effect from these? So last year we did Hudson Boulevard East and West next to block three, which is 34th to 35th, sorry, 35th to 36th. And we didn't really see any traffic effects. It's mostly contractors who are right now, who are using these streets. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's like regular pass through traffic. It's more contractors trying to park or trying to move through the block. So I don't think there was really that many adverse effects. Um, so we'll see this year. It'll be a little bit more normal. Still some construction traffic, but a little bit more normal. And remind me what your first question was. I was, was. just wondering what the hours that these are. Hours. So we're going to propose projects. six days a week, um, Monday through Saturday, probably nine to five or eight to five, something like that. Um, because we want to do maybe more adult programming, maybe partner with a dog run that's close by. So we could do like a dog meetup or something. I don't know. We want to expand programming beyond kids stuff. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Who manages the barricade? It's our how? okay, it's our park maintenance crew. So we have some employees who are groundskeepers and some contractors. And so they put them out whenever, you know, if it's eight in the morning, we, they put them out at eight. And then throughout the day, if they get moved, they'll put them back into place. And then at the end of the day, they'll move them back to the sort of sidewalk area. Or if they need to, they'll like lock them up to the side. Okay. All right. Do we have any uh, anybody else? Okay. We seem to have people in the uh, attendees who want to speak. Yeah, I'm bringing over Karen and Bernard. Yes. Bernard is over. Where is he? I see Karen here. I don't see Bernard. Karen, are you ready to talk? Oh, and Bernard. I'm here. sorry, I'm not sure which Karen you're looking for. Is it me? Yes. Yes. Okay, hi. I'm a resident of 22nd Street uh, between 8th and 9th well, Avenue. That's not the subject here. We're, We're not, not talking there. about that. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm talking about open streets. And right. I'm confused. But you are, been, we are going been... to have a whole session about that, Karen, to talk about it. This is... I beg your pardon. Please excuse me for having intruded. I, I'll come back. No, and no, say no. It you have not. That, that happened. Open up that street. The traffic's a nightmare. Thank you. I'll talk to you when it's time. Thank you. Okay. Bernard? The street is open. Yeah, I, I just had uh, one big question. As the number of people increase, what kinds of sanitation facilities and cleanup do you plan for the area? So we have a full crew of sanitation workers in the park and we're gonna use them to help service our open streets. So we have like a number of people who are there sweeping every day and then we have supervisors and groundskeepers who are also there. So it'll it's always going to be looked at while there's, you know, like probably 18 hours a day. We have a lot of sanitation and horticulture support. So we're going to lean on them to help us with this. Okay. What if, no, but you missed the other part of sanitation, which are bathroom facilities. You have a lot of children. You're going to have a, a need for places to change kids to provide bathroom facilities. How is that being provided for? Yes, we, we have a public restroom in the park on block three. So it's right in the middle of all these open streets that'll be open during the hours of the open street. Bernard, you have to come and uh, visit. Um, okay, and- Bob Not in Arnold. December, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Arnold. Yeah, okay, can you hear me guys? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna comment on something for both open street projects. As it turns out, concrete is the junk food version of walking surfaces. It's terrible on your knees and it's terrible on your feet. And we've put most of our surfaces as concrete. Um, in most of the areas, um, 
any natural surfaces are under lock and key. In Chelsea Park, it's all under lock and key. And in uh, any other park, it's under lock and key. And in the Hudson Yards, most of it is under lock and key also. You can't walk on a natural surface. And I don't see the project here showing any natural surface. We can't and hear so you. If you turn your head, we can't hear you. What? OK. I don't see any natural surfaces to walk on in this part of the project. And I'd like to see natural surfaces in the other project also. And I'll say them both at the same time here. Um, we have forgotten, we used to be all natural here and we've created concrete all over and it destroys your perception of reality. Uh, and this is something I'll have to send in separately, but you're not doing any natural surfaces for the kids. You, Got it. If, and if you don't have it, you don't learn it. You lose your perception of natural surfaces unless you have them to perceive. And, okay. so that's and I'm lucky. Let me say one more thing. I'm lucky. I live in Penn South. I have natural surfaces to walk on, and I walk on them every day. And after a year of doing so, I suddenly see nature. It's important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Patty, we'll, can you we'll explain? Keep that in mind. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep that in mind to add more natural surfaces. There is some um, lawn areas near parts of these open streets on block one. Um, but the roadway itself, yeah, that's a challenge to try and make it more natural, but that's a really good thing to keep in mind. Um, Cause yeah, the kids, um, I think, yeah, they deserve some yeah. variety. Yeah. Okay. They I think we're good. Thank you okay. so much. Right. So can we, uh, can somebody give me a resolution to I presume to approve those, uh, those streets? I make a resolution to approve those streets. Okay, we have second. a second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Very good. Thank Aye. you, Patty. Thank you, everyone. Okay. So now we're going to get into the third uh, piece of our agenda a community presentation of West 22nd Street. And for that section, I'm going to turn uh, the, to my co-chair, uh, Dale, to run this section. The reason is that um, I am present but uh, not eligible because CheckPeds has agreed to be the fiscal conduit for the, um, for the, for, for the street. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, in order to comply with the, you know, with the rules, uh, I am not running the meeting. I can participate in the meeting and make comments about it, but Dale will be running the meeting. And when it comes the time of voting, I will be present, not eligible. Thank you. Dale, you are taking the, the control. Thanks, Christine. So this is concerning uh, an open street that is currently in operation on 22nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenues. And we have um, a number of uh, uh, residents of the area uh, who wish to speak on the matter. And we also have the applicants of the original open streets um, application with the DOT. The open streets program is, as most of us know, is a DOT program which provides access to uh, segment, segments of our streets, not just for vehicles, but also for pedestrians and cyclists and other activities. Um, so we're going to hear from, who is it that's speaking on behalf of the residents, the local residents who are opposed to the open street? It's three of us. Um, Joe starting. Newhouse. Sorry? Who is starting? Uh, we're, we're gonna first introduce, all three of us are gonna introduce ourselves and then I'll start. Okay, so you're coordinating that. Is it possible yes. for Janine to share the presentation we sent? I could, I can share it here. I think. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so just we're going to start. We're going to start by hearing from some residents who are opposed to the open street, and then afterwards we'll hear from the applicants and the results of their uh, uh, kind of roundtable workshopping of proposals of like a way forward uh, with the open street. And I just want to advise everyone that uh, we are, this is your forum to hear uh, opposing views, various views of the neighborhood. But also I want us to all be clear that the name of the program 
from DOT is open streets. And what open streets refers to is a street that is accessible, not just for through traffic, but also for, in addition to traffic, uh, pedestrians and cyclists and other activities. So I want us to be all on the same page in terms of language. So the, the street is currently a part of the open streets program. The opponent, I'm sorry for the noise. There seems to be somebody doing construction in my building after hours. Uh, the opponents want to remove the open streets designation. In some of their materials, they say open the street, but that's confusing. So I would implore everyone to use, to go by the DOT terminology and discuss it as it currently within an open street program that you would like to end. So Joe, take us take it away. Okay, thanks very much. I'm Joe Newhouse. Uh, I live on the 300 block of West 22nd Street. Maybe Jeff and Molly can introduce themselves. Um, I'm Molly Harris. I live on uh, 200 block of West 22nd Street. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for letting us speak. I'm Jeff Preston. I'm on the 400 block of West 22nd Street. Okay, well, again, thank you for agreeing to hear us. Uh, we are here to present the views of a large group of neighborhood residents who think it is time to remove the barriers on West 22nd Street and reopen the block to normal travel. Um, Dale, I hear what you're saying, you, you like, the, but if to, to those of us who are on the other side of the barriers, it feels like a closed street. The designation as an open street was a temporary measure. It was designed to permit socially distanced outdoor activities during the pandemic. There was no community consultation. The 200 block, uh, the Chelsea West 200 Block Association, which is in whose name it was sought, is really, as far as we know, one person. It has not held a meeting since 2019, although Molly and several others have tried to, to participate. The open streets designation is up for renewal. And we are asking that community board four write the Department of Transportation a letter opposing renewal, or at least urging removal of the barricades. More than 1,000 people have signed a petition calling for the removal. We submitted uh, uh, several appendices they weren't done in, posted in the Dropbox, but I hope you have them. We do. Uh, the, we do. Oh, good. So the appendices have all the signatures and the text of the, of the petition. More than 230 of those thousand people are in the 10011 zip code alone. Another 240 are in Manhattan and elsewhere in New York. More than 50 people spontaneously added comments. Um, they are in also in appendix, appendix C, or rather a sample of them is in appendix C. Here are a few. I see no benefit and only problems with this random street closure. Another one, I live on this block, am a senior citizen and find that having to get out of a car or taxi to move the barriers when I return from a trip out of town is both dangerous and inconvenient. This street uh, closure creates more traffic on the busy 23rd Street. I see no good reason this street should be closed. It is no longer needed and a hassle for those who live on the block as well as delivery people. I'm against turning this public access, access street into a virtual private community. The same sentiments were voiced by many of the, of the people at the revisioning session held by the authors of the other report on October 15th. Their report, the other report, uh, documents more than 70 comments, much more than on any other topic that were made with respect to the barriers. And you can see those comments in appendix two of that report, the community workshop report at pages eight and nine. But here are a few samples. They are, the, the barriers are a danger to cars trying to open them, danger to bikers, emergency vehicles, garbage collection. The next one, barricade is a problem for all. All table participants agreed. Agree. Added difficulties during bad weather. Harassment to people in cars moving barriers. The fundamental problem here is that 200, the 200 block of West 22nd Street was a bad block to choose for an open street. There's nothing to attract use, nothing like the one we just saw with a, pair, a, a, a park right next to it. Nothing to attract people to it, hang out. There's no school, no playground. No restaurants with entrances on the block, not even a bike lane. Those are on 20th and 21st Street. The residents are not asking for this. Many prefer it to remain a street. 
But there is a large parking garage, underground parking garage under a very big uh, apartment building in the middle of the block. That means the gates need to be open dozens of time a day, dozens of times a day, every time someone returns their car. As a result, this block will always have traffic and frequent cars. It can't be a playground where children can run around and play. Also, this is one of the few eastbound streets. Here, let me show you a map. One of the few eastbound streets, through streets uh, from west to east. The, the map shows the dotted line across the middle is, is 23rd Street. Just below it is 22nd Street. The, the open, block, open street is that little red line uh, between 7th and 8th. Um, you can see that Madison Square Park blocks 24th and 25th Street. Um, the bus lane, the 23rd Street is now down to one lane of traffic because the other lane is given over to bus lanes. Union Square at the bottom of the map blocks 15th and 16th Street. On 20th Street between 7th and 8th, there's the 10th Precinct, which is frequently closed as well. They often close that street. Also, and importantly, to the left of the of 8th Avenue on this map, you'll see the block with PS11 uh, on 21st Street. That's closed many days of the week. Uh, sorry, that's closed on all school days uh, during school hours. And to the west of that on 21st Street between 9th and 10th is another open street mm -hmm. designation, designated. Um, and so choosing 22nd Street between um, uh, eight, uh, 7th and 8th disrupts one of the very few through streets across Chelsea um, and um, ignores the open streets laws preference for contiguous pedestrian malls. If you were one block south, you'd have three blocks that are, are uh, in some ways uh, disrupted every day. I'll hand it over to Jeff now. Good evening. Um, Joe, are you gonna move the slides for me? Thank you. So, Obviously, the barriers and the inconvenience and for all the reasons we talked about um, are all the negatives, right? And then you would say you would hope that there's a lot of positives to why this has been considered an open street or why there's all this fuss and why potentially DO2 would be investing a lot of money. To date, there's been very little use. All this is is a street that we perceive as closed with barriers, and it's empty almost all the time. Um, even in the report, as you'll as they'll go through, they 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 cite one community event in two and a half years, which was um, chalking rainbow flags on the street, which is great, but nothing like the last presentation where you have active use and programming to encourage use of the street. Um, I don't know how many of you on the committee have actually spent time at this intersection, but I think it's important um, because it is very dangerous. Um, anytime you choose to go down the street, you have to stop in the crosswalk. There are obviously people trying to cross, which you're blocking. You have to get out of your car. Um, you have to block traffic on 8th Avenue. If you're behind a car that's doing that, you're now two cars deep or three cars deep. The light changes. You're waiting for someone to open the gate. This person who opened the gate, guess what they want to do? They want to close the gate and not let you in. So now you're like negotiating with someone whether or not you're allowed to go behind them and forget the third person. So this has created such a such confusion about who's allowed to go down the block and the idea that you have to get out of your car to open a gate in the middle of 8th Avenue is, is, is what has draw, driven so many people to say this is crazy. And that's why we have so many people that um, are, are enlisted with us to say, please, 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 let's think about this rationally. So it's very dangerous with all the cars backing up. Um, some of us have to leave our children in a car. If we're driving, I have a car, I have kids and they're in the car. And if I want to go down the street and not bump with other traffic, you're leaving your children in the car unattended. It makes no sense. Um, this is difficult for the elderly and it's not ADA compliant. So um, again, we can call it an open street, but is this street open to people that are disabled? I would say no, right? People that can't get out of their car or you know don't have access, um, it's, it's not easy to get down the street. And imagine if it's in bad weather, you have rain, now you're being told, you know, imagine you're parking in this garage, you're driving, you wanna go down the street to park your car, it's pouring rain, you have to get out of your car to move the barriers, that, that's, that's what people have been, have been faced with the last two and a half years. And when it's dark, the block feels empty and unsafe. And again, people are getting out of their cars um, in this situation. Uh, next page, please. Yeah. Um, the other issue is 
this is impacting this is this is not just an issue for people who own cars, right? We've we've heard at some of the pr recent presentations only twelve percent only twelve percent of Chelsea residents own cars. You can be a resident of Manhattan or Chelsea and decide you want to go to the airport and you need to get an Uber. You're getting a delivery for all those people on the block and in the neighborhood. The this this these barricades are impacting their access to transportation. That someone had said a few weeks ago. And I think that's the best way of putting it. People are disadvantaged on the block because they can't get access to taxis, Ubers, delivery people, family visiting, et cetera. And emergency vehicles are delayed. We've seen fire trucks have to deal with the barricades, ambulances have to deal with the barricades. Uh, you've heard a story about one of our um, neighbors, Nico, whose father had a heart emergency and she had to run to open the gate to get an Uber driver in. Uber drivers think this block is closed. They will not go down the street. They're not gonna get out of their cars. They'll just cancel the ride. And people all the way east of, of this street are being disadvantaged. And the other thing is the traffic just doesn't go away. So we can't just magically you know, put blinders on and say, okay, well, if we put barricades up and the people on the block who are supportive of this wanna have a quiet street, the traffic doesn't go away. It just gets diverted. And a lot of other streets are also not happy about this, right? So 23rd Street is already backed up. The 200 block, um, if, you, if, you, if you're getting to 8th Avenue and you sit the barricade and you say, okay, I'm not going to go through the barricade, I'm going to go north, you have to go all the way to 26th Street to get it through Street. So we're creating, we're having people go round and round in circles um, in an already difficult neighborhood. As Joe mentioned, you have a lot of other closures on the street. 21st Street with the school, you have the other open street on 21st between 9th and 10th. So literally we're, we're, we're creating a spider web in a very small area for people to have difficulty navigating with cars. Um, and, and residents are not happy about the extra diverted traffic. Um, the, other, the other important part is we have a large business on this block. The only business, only major business on the block is the, is the parking, uh, the parking lot. And um, we've heard the other side reference how the parking lot's doing fine. Um, we actually on, on the call, which I hope you'll in, you'll you'll permit this person to speak later, is the general counsel for Icon. Icon owns the parking garage on the street. Um, they have data that this this parking garage is down twenty three percent compared to two thousand nineteen, and their other garages in the area are up an average of thirty nine percent. So to say that it's just because of the pandemic, it's definitely not true. Um, they have obviously their monthly customers. But daily traffic has cut down. They've had to cut their hours. They've reduced staff from, from, uh, from five to three. These are real, real implications of having the barriers. Um, it's not just pie in the sky. And uh, Spencer's on, on, on this call if we want to invite him to speak to give his perspective. Thanks, Jeff. Who's next up? Um, uh, Mont. yes. Hi, how are you? Um, just wanting to finish up and say, um, the report does not address why this block was chosen, but the problem will not go away. The report ignores the block was chosen without consideration of alternatives, just where our proponents happen to live. And I wanna just preface that by saying that we as a community are su super supportive of many of the open street programs. Some of them, like the one we just pre previously heard from, um, the, the amount of time is still reduced compared to this block, which is 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, seven days a week, 365. Um, and um, the report also um, talks about nearby blocks to offer contiguous pe pedestrian malls and natural attractions. Again, we, we reiterated the issues. You can move on. Uh, next slide. Um, next, yeah. uh, the report also on, ignores the traffic needs that to ignores that through traffic needs to go to already restricted streets and ignores the public garage. I will want to say that um, there are people who are involved with our, our side who have been very big community activists in terms of uh, the, uh, the pocket park on 20th Street and um, support the idea of open spaces for the community. We just feel like this 22nd Street is just, this 200 block is just wrong block. And we wanted to recognize that this block is the wrong block to push for a long-term revision. It's time to reopen the block or at least um, return the block without the barriers. Um, uh, and I want to say one thing about the idea of open close. I know it's a, a very complicated and, and, and ripe with, um, with um, passion, but I do think that there's an interest, a difference between impact and intent. I know that the DOT says it's an open street, but the impact is that it feels closed. 
that's how I feel. And that's how many, when I've been told I'm not allowed down the block, it means it's not open to me. And I've been told that on many occasions. Living on the block, I've been told I can't drive down it personally. And many of my neighbors as well. They're told it's closed. So even though you say it's open, the community is telling us it's closed. Residents, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate the presentation uh, for being concise. Uh, we'll now hear from, who is it from the applicants that is presenting the results of the uh, workshop that was recently conducted? Yeah. Is it Melody? I, I will be presenting, thank you. Hi, Tom, thank Hi. you. Ceramic? Do you yeah. have uh, do you have uh, visuals? I do. I shared them with Janine. Janine, okay. pull them yeah, up. I'll, I'll pull them up right now. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Um. That's great. Thank you, Janine. Now I just need to find my script. It got uh, minimized somehow. Okay. All right. Um, first, I, I just want to thank everyone uh, for allowing us the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Janine, if you could follow with me, please turn to page two. Thank you. The acknowledgments. It took many people to bring this project about, and I just want to highlight them. First and more, foremost, Melody Bryant, New York City DOT, Manhattan Community Board 4, Eric Botcher and Jordan Finer, Pamela Wolf and the Chelsea West 200 Block Association, Christine Berte and Check Peds, St. Paul's Church, and all the local businesses, volunteers, and participants who helped make our workshop a great success. Page three, please. Existing conditions and demographics. Page four, please. Context map. Within a 10 minute walk, there is one adult program regional park on the eastern edge of the walk. There are five children's playgrounds that are not programmed for adults without children. There's four subway lines, eight bus lines, seven bike lanes, eight eastbound streets, and 47 parking garages. In this neighborhood, th oh, sorry, this is, this is a neighborhood where 91% of residents do not have children, 22% walk to work, 12% own cars, and 5% drive to work. Five, uh, page five, please. Uh, our West 22nd Open Street has a large canopy of trees covering eight, its 800 foot length. There are almost 1000 residents who live on the block. Property is zoned for commercial and residential use with no publicly accessible open space except for the street. 78% of the block is multifamily residential comprised of many very small studios and one bedrooms. Most rear yards are small and inaccessible to all but a few ground floor residents. There are 10 commercial storefronts. There is an eight, eight sorry, an 85 space accessory commercial parking garage under a 150 unit apartment building. And Cinep uh, the uh, Sinopolis uh, Cinemas has a small loading dock facing the street. The 2020 census for uh, 1001 states there are 50,000 residents, 91, as I said before, 91% um, are, are adults without children. The average age is 42. The way people travel to work highlights the need for additional publicly accessible open space. 5% drove alone, 14% work from home, 22% walk to work, 51% use public transit, and 8% biked, carpooled, or use some other form of transportation. Uh, page six, please. Introduction and project history. Page seven, please. 
in 2020, COVID, the, the COVID pandemic hit New York City. New York City began its open street program. DOT designated West 22nd between 7th and 8th Avenues, a limited local access open street. The hours of operation are 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week with a five mile per hour speed limit. In 2021, uh, Melody, Bryant and Transportation Alternatives conducted a two-week on-street survey. 156 people responded. The vast majority lived on the street and within the neighborhood. They support the open street and want it improved with more trees and greenery. They found it to be cleaner, safer, and quieter than before the COVID pandemic. Most did not own cars. Most did not want to maintain the manual gates at the 8th Avenue entrance. Nearly half wanted protected seating and a five mile per hour speed limit. In 2022, check beds provided funding to replace the original heavy clawed feet barricades with a lighter weight linked fence system that has flat feet for an easier slide open. DOT provided large plastic urns filled with seasonal plants and small trees. Volunteers celebrated LGBTQ plus pride by painting rainbows and hearts on the street. We conducted a community visioning workshop that had 63 attendees. Page eight, please. Workshop proceedings and design options A, B, and C. Page nine, please. Workshop analysis of community priorities and concerns. The workshop lasted two and a half hours with 63 attendees. There were 50 participants, 11 facilitators, and two organizers. 80% of participants live within 10011. 40% are car owners. This ownership is greater than 12, the 12% who own cars within 10011 and 7% more than those surveyed on the street in 2021. Of the 552 individual and group responses, the number one concern was improving the open street entrance area and gates. That was followed by providing signage, greenery, and seating in new plaza areas. Page 10, please. The workshop results informed our three street redesign proposals. Option A does not require any entrance gate and is the preferred long-term uh, solution. It incorporates a shared or complete street model as outlined in New York City street plan New York City street plan. The street becomes curbless with priority given to pedestrians. Safety measures are built into the street design to guide drivers through at a maximum of five miles per hour. These measures can include bollards, planters, trees, and seating areas. The, a signpost is placed at the entrance alerting drivers and pedestrians to this new type of street. Option B does not require an entrance gate and is suggested to be the initial phase of a shared or complete street redesign as outlined in option A. It incorporates most of the amenities mentioned in option A, but retains the existing street curb. Option C, does require an automated entrance gate set into the block to alleviate the occasional backup of cars entering the street. It does not include all the horizontal and vertical amenities outlined in option A that are intended to slow the driver's speed to five miles per hour, hence the need for a gate and retains the existing curb. It is included in this report because many workshop attendees liked having the entrance gate, but believed the current arrangement led to too many conflicts. We do not recommend this option. Pages 
11, 12, and 13 show drawings that highlight the various details of the three options. To explain them now would require more time than we have tonight. Page 14, please. Alignment with New York City policy and best practices. Page 15, please. Our proposed redesign of West 22nd's Open Street aligns with the following New York City policies. New York City DOT Street Design Manual, New York City Streets Plan, New York City DOT Pedestrian Safety and Older New Yorkers Plan. The New York City Street Plan states, our streets are places where people work, play, and interact with each other. Public funds are being dedicated to creating street environments that meet our human needs. This means redesigning existing road space by adding high quality pedestrian amenities, such as seating and landscaping, to create safe and comfortable environments for everyone. Our three design options enhance pedestrian space and create a stronger local community, a sense of community, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry, uh, a sense of community, uh, improved safety and security, greater access for all, and a healthier New York City. To quote from noted urban planner, San Francisco urban planner, Alan Jacobs, sociability is a large part of why cities exist and streets are a major if not the only public place for that sociability to develop page 16 please page 17 please in, the, in conclusion um, <clears throat> sorry our Open street design benefits the community in the following ways. It removes the inconvenience of having to manually move gates. It adds greenery, plazas, and seating that improve community ties and the local economy. It widens the pedestrian space. It calms traffic. It makes the streets safer and healthier for all. We humbly request the following action from CB4 support our goals of turning West 22nd Open Street into a shared and complete street, support our long-term goals outlined in option A, which you can find in great detail in the 114-page the report that we created, to create a new public place that is attractive, healthy, and accessible for all. This requires significant capital funding. Support our goals of improving West 22nd Street immediately as outlined in option B. This does not require capital funding and can be instituted within weeks or days. Page 18, please. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much. Uh, am I, wait a minute, am I, I'm, I'm not on mute. Okay, thanks very much, Tom. That was a comprehensive report. And just so we're clear, Tom, it was yourself and, and Melody Bryan who were the applicants of the, the initial open streets designation for this block, is that correct? No, um, I am a uh, 40 year urban planner. I, I have lived on the block for 30 years and I volunteered to help Melody uh, with this program after she got it up and running. Oh, I see. So you came in not after the, not at the onset, but somewhat at some point later. Correct. Understood. Okay. All right. So now we're going to have a uh, <clears throat> discussion within the um, committee, and then we'll let open up, open it up to comments from uh, the public who wishes to speak on this topic. So I'm going to go in the order I see uh, David Solnik. Yeah, I'm. Um... I mean, I, my first comment is sort of a bit of confusion. It seems to me that these two groups are in agreement. I'm not, I don't understand why they're being considered oppositional. The The first group main, main point was that they don't like the gates. The second group 
main point or, or, or not main point, but a, ma a, ma a major point was to get rid of the gates. So it seems to me that I, I, I'm not quite sure what the conflict is. Um, I mean, I think you've identified a point of agreement between the two groups. Absolutely. But it's not only a point of agreement, but it seems to me that if the if the second if what the second group is proposing removes the gates, I'm not sure what the first group is opposing. Um, I think they want uh, the open streets designation removed from the street, so it would just be a through street, like like the rust. And right, but, but the, the concern, I'm sorry, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the, Joe. This is a period in which the committee has discussions. If we have any questions for you, I'll address them to you. This okay. is not your time to speak. Yes, they they don't want any constraints, but the constraint that they particularly don't want is gates. Right. So yes, I I agree that I agree with your <laughs> assessment that it's a common it's a common goal of both groups the, the barricade. So I, I guess I guess the question then is does the first group not only not want gates but also does not want to slow traffic? Okay. Now we'll. Now we'll put this question directly to Joe. Joe, is your goal to simply remove the barricades or you want to remove the open streets designation and make this 22nd a through street? Because a lot of your presentation was about eastbound traffic across town. No, Dale, I wouldn't, sorry, I wouldn't, I wouldn't phrase the question that way. I really want to know, yeah, it, it will be an open, it will be a gateless street in either case. The question is, do they want the traffic to flow at, at the speed limit of 25, 20, 20, in, well, in I mean, 30 miles an hour? It's, it's, the, same question. Let's get, let's it's get the same question asked a slightly different way. It's okay. either, yeah, it's, it's Joe, either- do you mind if I seven. jump in on this one? Sure, and I think we both have something to say. Why don't you go first? Please go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, everyone. So it's, it's an interesting question, David. Um, you know, the barricades are what we're all faced with now. And I think the, the real question comes down to, is why this block? Like, we can, can you all just, say- Jeff, Would you mind just answering the question for us? Would, do you want to see this block returned to a through street or not? 25 miles per hour. 25 miles per I, hour. I'm, get, I'm sorry, Dale, I'm getting there. The answer is yes. We think that this okay. block should be a regular street okay. because we think that's other all we places- really need. Maybe that's all we really need spot for that. That's and all, th that's all we th really need from you right now. We're going to return to committee discussion. Can Thank I just you. add one word, which is also no, a matter of timing? I'm going to return to, this is our time to discuss this topic. So you've made your point. You've had your time. Okay. Uh, David, are, do you have any more comments? Uh, I'll, I'll come back. Okay. Uh, next up is Charlie. Um, thanks for the presentations from uh, from both groups. Um, I agree with the comments that David made that you know it seems like the uh, the thing that the first group is most upset about is the barricades and the burden of the barricades and and the group that is maintaining the open street wants to get rid of the barricades. So that's a great point of agreement. Um, I uh, it's interesting to hear though that they are not in support, perhaps uh, at least based on Jeff's comments, of having a shared street and a safe street and a complete street. Um, which I am very supportive of. And I think um, I, a lot of the arguments that the group that is uh, not in favor of the current status quo are making are related to the barrier and having to get out and move the barrier in the rain, which by the way, pedestrians are also in the rain, cyclists are also in the rain. Not everybody is in a private metal box. Um, so, I, but I understand the concerns of having to get out the concern about the person with the heart issue, the concerns about deliveries. I, I understand there, that there are some concerns about barricades on your street, but it, it seems to me that a complete street with a five mile an hour speed limit with all of the wonderful things. And if you read the report from the group maintaining the street, there's street seating, there's um, you know benches all around the trees. There's a lot of additional planters. It seems like a lovely street. And the question that keeps getting asked by the first group is, well, why this street? It seems like a random street. And it's and it's it's this street because there's some community activists that signed up for it and had maintained it and had worked really hard for it and have presented before us before. But my question would be, why not every street? Why is every street in Chelsea not five miles an hour with planters and benches? That, that's what I would like to see. So I see no reason why, why this street can't have a beautiful street with planters and benches and five mile an hour speed limit. Thanks. 
Thanks, uh, Dale, Dale, just a little note. Are we in a phase, just a procedural, are we in a phase of asking questions and then making comments at the end or, or, do or have, you want all do of we, it at the same time? Just we have questions from board members rather than... Right. Can we go to questions from board members? Who's got a question among the, among the committee? I see uh, Carl and I see Alan, you'll be next, Alan. Uh, thank you, and thanks to both groups. Um, and I, I would like to just, uh, you know, commend the folks on the block that have been maintaining this. That is a really big challenge with very little support from the city. Um, so I, it's, it's unfortunate that you know you trying to make a, you know, more pedestrianized, safer block has put you in conflict with your neighbors. So I'm really sorry that that has happened. Um, the uh, my question though, you know, I just uh, full school, I just worked very hard on creating Fifth Avenue into an open street for three Sundays, and obviously Fifth Avenue and Twenty Second Street are very different. But there are some things that I think we learned that I think are missing here. That you know, I, I have questions, and a big part of that is programming. Um, I think you know it, it is going to be hard to. I think it's hard to sell. Uh, you know, having an open street without a robust you know programming and you know that can go that can vary in many different things people can be very creative about what that means i think another thing we heard from uh, pro, uh you know proponents or, or people that were anti open street was that no one was coming they felt it wasn't being used and i think uh you know programming is a big part of making it used so i'm just curious uh my first point is i i would like to know what uh what programming do you all have in mind uh, that could work in a, in the short term, or that you have you know ideas that have come up? And second, um, you know eight eight a.m. to eight p.m. It's a very long time. Uh, that's even longer than what the bid, uh, uh, you know, what Hudson Yards Hudson Kitchen was proposing for their open streets, which are staffed and maintained. So, I'm curious if you've thought about reducing some of the hours as maybe a short term compromise position, and what kind of programming ideas. Uh, you all have to make the open street successful. And to Carl's question, if there's programming, like what what time of day would it be? Because that right. could help us yeah. again the hours. Who's going to? Uh, Melody, would you speak to that, or would Tom speak to that? Melody, do you want to speak? I can speak to some of this. Um, as to the reason there has been no programming, uh, programming takes money, and we haven't had money. We've just had volunteers. So we applied for a grant last year. And um, what, uh, the first thing we did was the uh, Pride Barracuda event. It was a very small event, um, but we were listening to the community and how much they hated the gates. And we understood that. We have been slapped. We've been spat at. We've been, one of us was hit by a car. Well, that's not the question. Okay. Yeah. I'm just telling you, people don't hit the gates and gates make it worse. So we I just want to see if you can address the question, which is yes. future programming, when, what and when. Okay, so we decided to use that money for the workshop so we can get rid of the gates. Um, there's going to be programming in the spring. And one of the reasons there's going to be programming is that in order to have an open street now, you have to have it a weekly programming event. So we will be doing that. I have not gotten as far as to, you know, talk to people about what hours would be good. Summer is different than winter. So I really can't answer that question right now. I can answer it. So in I, would, subsequent, I, would say, yeah. I would say, you know, think about those. Think yeah. about that because we'll expect some answers on okay. that. Okay, that's good. And can um, I just say, Dale, just qu just to quickly just follow up again? You yeah. know, you all are volunteers. I understand that, and it's really unfortunate that you know if DOT wants this to work. You know, there needs to be more support for folks on the ground that are, you know, spending a lot of their time to make it happen. I get that's all. Yeah, I'm I mean, saying. we'll also recognize that like the previous dem the previous. Applicant was a bid, and the bid has more resources than uh, some volunteers that live on the street. Uh, Jesse, thank you, thank you, Dale. Um, I'm I, I just starting here with a question because I think we're in question time. Yes. And, and uh, uh, so first, for for full disclosure and full transparency, uh, uh, Joe and I have met a couple of times uh, uh, or talked a couple of times. We're, we're old colleagues from, from Sullivan and Cromwell, although we actually never met there. Um, but uh, uh, Joe, you know, when we spoke, we were only ever, you know, all I, you know, I heard from you and heard from your side was about the gates and, and uh, uh, to c come to this meeting and hear that both sides are in agreement about the gates. I actually do think it is important to hear from you now 
why you are still opposed to an, a shared street uh, a vision going forward. If both sides are for the immediate removal of these gates as you work towards a, a shared street vision, why why is your side still uh, take issue with that? I, I would like to hear that. So, yeah, that's, so that's, you know what we're talking about. Two, two points. Jeff made one before, which is that this is the wrong block for this. Uh, it's a through street and uh, and one of the few through streets. There are other blocks right you know, nearby that would offer a contiguous open street if you were looking for that. That's point so does one. Your, does, your, does your group propose an alternative location? No, uh, we're, we didn't. We haven't tried to develop anything beyond saying, okay. look, this is the wrong street. And the okay, second, the second, second point is, sorry, I apologize. Yes, yeah, the so second what, point is a matter of timing, which is, you know, it's going to be months or years for any of these alternative A's or alternative B's to put in place. DOT may very well not support this, may not fund it. Um, and in the meantime, we don't think we should be faced with this, what with the situation we're faced in now, which is a, a set of barriers for, to create an open street. 12 hours a day or six hours okay. a day. I think, um, you've made, with, I think you've made your points. We're going to go back to more Dale, questions. Dale, can I just... But it, it, no, we're going to go back to more it's, questions it's from the committee. related to your question about an alternative street. And I think we do have two alternative streets, I think, which would well, make... Well, what are they? So the school block, one block south, 21st Before between 8th and 9th, you, have, you don't have a major garage, parking garage on the block. It's already closed during school hours. And let the kids use the street for a playground. That PS eleven is already, already in effect. It's not. It's not an open street, and they're not using it that such. They're just blocking the traffic. And so, if they want to actually put money and do some work to a street, so that's you want to open. Street. You want to open the street that has the school when they use it as a yard to five mile an hour traffic. They don't, they don't know. The school is blocked. You can't go, the only thing that goes down that street- I know, is but blocks. what you would propose if you made that an open street block, there would be a traffic flow during their playground hours. I'm sorry, call it what you want, but call what's it what you the want, other but, but the point is there's a crossing what's, guard there. There's no the traffic other, allowed. What's the other proposal, Jeff? And then the block that is, that is, that is also an open street that is 21st between 9th and 10th, which also Ooh. doesn't have a big garage. And you only have residents that's on one side of the street. street. Okay. I'm sorry. That's already an open street. Yeah, but it's also not being used. There's no programming. It's like okay. Okay. Yeah. Your Is proposals there... are non-proposals, but let's move on. So uh, just ask ask like not a, not I'm sorry. A... I'm sorry. We're gonna go back to committee discussion. Uh did you have yeah, some... just ask one one quick follow-up, which is just to say to, to Tom or or um Melody, uh, just because I'm trying to figure out if, if the agreement is like if both sides really are in agreement on the immediate removal of the barricades while the future of this street gets worked out. So, so Tom and Melody, are you? Would you be in favor of the immediate removal of the barricades? No, you would not be. Okay, so that's that is an, still an issue. It would be for pending pending the implementation of one of the options drawn out. Okay, okay I'm going to go Thank to you. Alan. Sorry, Alan, I I skipped you. So, just questions, no comments at this point. Do you have a question? I have a couple of questions. Yeah, go. Um, for it. Firstly, um, I've been a resident of 22nd Street between 9th and 10th for 27 some odd years. Some folks might still consider me a newcomer. And just for transparency, also I'm a member of uh, CheckPeds. So I have a couple of questions and directed right now at the plans. Um, is the plan that you're proposing, um, is that something that DOT you think is going to um, spread throughout the neighborhood? Is this a plan that you think can um, be duplicated on every street that people want it? Or is this something that is just gonna be a customized um, street? Is it, uh, in other words, are you, are you asking if it's something like a pilot, Alan? Yeah. It, um, I, want, I want, may I uh, answer that? Please. Uh, yeah, Alan, um, I've talked to the DOT and the way they are looking at those things right now, they are looking at the open streets as a, 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 you know, a precursor to some shared street. Because with the open street, what you are doing is testing mm -hmm. whether things work or not, right? And then, uh, and then if you do shared street, uh, so that the shared street would be not everywhere. It, it would be only where people ask for it. Mm -hmm. 
or where people have had open streets. Okay, so my other question, Tom, um, you mentioned that it's going to require capital funds. Um, have you come up with any idea what it would cost to do Plan A? Are you asking me? Yes. Yeah, Tom, can you ballpark it? Option A? <laughs> no, it, it really is not in my bailiwick. Uh, all I've heard is from DOT is that they want to do something this coming year, 2023. They want to do something quickly. Okay, so they can do things quick. I mean, DOT does have a program, bump outs, and um, uh, certainly um, the raised uh, crosswalk is probably one of the yeah. primary things that should be done uh, throughout the, the city. And I think uh, the mayor has proposed looking at all these intersections, you know, I don't know how many, a thousand or something. So that is certainly something we want to want to do. Because to you want to raise, uh, from what I understand, you want to fill the street so everything is level across yeah, the, one and the other. The, the street would be raised to the existing curb level. Right. in option A, and it would be modeled after the Dutch Woonerf, which you probably are familiar with, Not familiar design with where you have uh, essentially the, the roadway where cars drive and the places where pedestrians are at the same level. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the pedestrian um, you know, the seating areas and planting areas would be delineated so that the car couldn't enter into that space. Um, all, all of the designs would be done to uh, guide the driver through the street rather than having it as a straightaway. The I way think that's, okay, I think that's enough. So, so, right answer. Okay, so this isn't just filling in the roadway with and yeah, it in. You've got, you've got, you've got infrastructure, you've got sewers that have to be raised. This is not just filling it in. This is a big project. But it's a capital concern, project for sure. Yeah. My, my other concern is what about runoff? I mean, we have on your block and oh. other blocks, you have staircases going down to the basement. Um, I think that know? would be an element the, the, of the, the curbs, um, the curbs, the curbs, you know, divert the water down to the sewers at this point. These storms that we're having now and, and they're getting worse and they're getting more often, you've got a lot of water coming down to a whole flat surface. So, I mean, that's- Alan, if, if I may, the, um, you know, all this design would be done by DDC with, and taking in, in account all the, the you, you know, the- uh, right. uh, I know, I understand that, but so that's-, that's, also that's but there that's, also that's, might be a water capture effect from the. So, this, here, so, so here's the so here's the comment part. So that's public funds, okay. And if it's public funds, it should be something that should be done throughout the city, throughout the community, not just one particular uh, one particular uh, street that is going to be customized uh, for their own use. I mean, how does that benefit the the rest of the community? Are people going to come to your street to? To exercise on your exercise equipment, you think? Uh, possibly, okay. I mean, but, uh, Alan, the, the answer point? to yeah. the answer to that was shared street are going to be done, are being done all over the city. No, but but share street, share street is a different story. We're talking about a substantial out, uh, a request for a substantial outlet of funds, public funds, in a time when going now years down the road, the city needs funds for transportation, schools homeless, blah, 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 not to make uh, a street look like Holland, okay? No, no, no disrespect to Holland, but we live in New York City, different circumstances, different culture. Different so it's like an needs. equity so, argument that you want to see this more <laughs> wide no, I think, I think, I think, or a more I think, comprehensive or a more <laughs> comprehensive uh, Way to determine which street gets this treatment or which street. I think I think there are there are there are plans through DOT. There are uh, resources that can be used that they're doing in different parts. That should be our focus to push safety and calming of streets without without. I think it's a great plan. If if I lived somewhere else in 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 a different setting. And I would have to agree with the folks that this was not a great street to begin with. It was a problem street. 
You have Eighth Avenue is is a horrendous street as it is now. Double park trucks, double park cars. Um, I myself walk down the street. I often help people walk around cars that are sitting in the crosswalk waiting to be wait, wait, waiting to be. But so I'll, I'll I, reserve. I think, I, I think I just you, got to you got the picture. Next. Next. I was gonna, we can't hear anything, Viren. You can't hear me. Okay, let me try again. Both teams presented their case, I think, fairly sort of um, compellingly. Um, I'm going to go back to Alan's point. I think you have to look at open streets in a, in a sort of very fair manner as like acceptable streets. And there has been no study. City hasn't done anything. And I don't know exactly how to sort of make an assessment about which block is the right block. But in this particular scenario, the two things that I'm going to propose are, I, I ask for, actually. Um, I think we're not then, there yet. Christine, yeah. you want to talk or should I, should I continue? No, 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 no. I was asking whether they are, you want, are we still in the in the questions? Because we have a zillion of people on the, of the community. Christine, I'm talking. So let me, all right, sorry. Don't leave my questions, all right? Thank you. The question is, do we have any traffic impact studies either, either through DOT or 200 block association, number one. Number two, do we have any pedestrian volume sort of in terms of um, efficient use of 22nd Street as a, two, uh, as a sort of pedestrian street? Do we have any such studies? Because I only have just a, a, a two blocks south of 22nd Street. And I walked on 8th Avenue and also on 7th Avenue and yes, a lot of observations that the community folks have made, I have witnessed that those two, that state is by and large pretty empty, not being used by anyone. So going back to the programming question, going back to the sort of traffic impact study and the pedestrian volume study, I think we might have a better case to make. And last but not, last but not the least, Bell, is um, maybe the, I mean, the city has to do a sort of comprehensive open street plan. I mean, that would, that, that would make tremendous sense. I think that's a compelling point, Viren, that, you know, going off of what Alan said as well, that we can ask the DOT to look more comprehensively at the, the plans. Yes, uh -huh. and there's one, one, one quick suggestion that I'm going to make. And we, you know, Alan's also right about um, how much money we won't, won't spend where. The, the New York City mayor has just announced that he's going to cut library budget, right? And then we have this kind of other plan, plans that we want to ask. Um, money for. So my suggestion is that why not also, also look at um, low-hanging fruit. The example that I will give you is uh, downtown Manhattan, the Broadway, um, Nassau Street um, situation, which has been there for the last 30, 40 years now, where there are shared streets, sidewalks are at whatever level they're supposed to be, and the streets are actually paved with cobblestone. So it, there's a traffic calming, calming sort of strategy there, which works pretty well. Pedestrians walk comfortably, cars slow down because they have to, they don't have any other choice. So I think there might be ways in which we can find low hanging fruit and get something that is very implementable fairly quickly. Within our districts. Yes, within our district, yes. All right, <laughs> thanks Viren. Uh, we already heard from, we already heard from Charlie out. Could you just, uh, committee members, lower your hands if your hands are just up from before. I want to see who's remaining who has comments or questions. I, I still do. Have a, I still have one. Dave, I'm going to circle back to you because we heard you once. Okay. Uh, David Warren, you haven't spoken yet. Do you have a question or a comment? Yes, just very quickly. I want to correct a misinformation. Uh, one of the speakers that said uh, the community was not consulted about this. I believe it was in 2020, the community board voted on this unanimously in favor of this. Yeah. And at that time, the community had the choice, people who were against it or for it had the right to speak for or against it, whether they chose to do it or not is that's one true. thing. That's so true. It should we, be did, we did have a, I mean, it was a little bit rushed because of COVID, but we did have a uh, public process to determine. Correct. And, and I think that that, that should be noted. The letter goes just, back to 2020. Yeah, the right. first letter. I think it should be noted. This just wasn't just rammed down people's throats. I think not that, random. No, it's I not, understand that. Yeah. I want to be noted because I think that we will note that had, had implied that it was, and it's yeah. not. We will I note that, think, David. Also, because yeah. the time is short, I think at some point in the future, we we with the 22nd Street Association should figure out 
how to uh, get bollards or, get, or gates it, to work better with, than they are now. And somehow there has to be a committee or something, to you, a brain trust to do this. So thank okay. you. All right. We've already yeah. heard. We've already heard. Yeah, can I just ask a procedural question? Sorry. Uh, are we just going through and doing questions? Like, I, I have more Let me go back to think... everybody who's got their hands raised. I just want to make sure everybody's had at least one opportunity to speak, and then we're going to go for second helpings. But I guess it's, I guess it's, are this is this question time, and then we hear the, from the public, and then we come back. We are going to hear comments. from the public, but we'd, I, I mean, I, we need to get to that. So let me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Solnick, David Solnick, please. And, and please let's, to committee members and to the members of the public, it's 9.30. Let's move this along. Let's not repeat ourselves. Let's be concise. David. Is there any way to do a proper survey? I, I don't think either group has, you know, one group has said they have a thousand people on a petition, but it turns out they're all over New York or all over the zip code. That's not very useful. The other group has done a workshop and a large percentage of those people were in favor, a very large percentage. You could argue a workshop is not necessarily representative of the block. Um, is there a way? I mean, first of all, it's you know, if if I, I think if you asked a simple we question, could ask a, we could ask a consultant to yeah, I to mean, study this to study this conflict and to study the situation. Although, I, yes, and I think that would be a good I'm idea. I'm sorry, Jeff. Could you please lower your hand? This is not your time to speak. This is committee discussion. I think that would be a good idea. Um, okay. Although, although I do, I do think that if you simply ask the question of the people on the block, you know, objectively, do you want a street of twenty-five without gates with twenty at twenty-five miles an hour through street, or do you want a street without gates at five miles per hour? Hard to believe they would say the former, but right. but I think it would be worth. Um, I think that's worth I think asking. We're roll that into the more comprehensive look in addition to engaging with the DOT and in addition to like get some hard facts in addition to like making take a more comprehensive look at our district. Charlie, yes. and again, I'm asking everyone, concise and brief, uh, brief and concise, myself. Understood. Um, concise. So getting back to the, the agreement of wanting the barricades to be gone. Um, and it seems I, I'm sympathetic that if we even if we do get vision A or vision B, and by the way, vision B is not a big capital program. It doesn't have the raised street, so they've already they have options for that. But um, that it, I understand that could take six months. No, probably not. It could take two years. So I think really what needs to be negotiated here is what happens in the interim. And so my question for both sides is when for those who want to keep the barricades up, what hours are most important to keep them up? When is it used the most? And for those who want the barricades to come down. When is it most important to you that they come down? Because perhaps I, I feel like if we're going to find any middle ground, it's in this interim period between okay. now and I a long term. Great, I think that's a great couple of questions to the people involved, and I'm going to hold them until I get through this these hands, and then I'm going to ask those. Um, Brett, you haven't spoken yet, so do you have something concise to say? How unusual? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm a little confused. You know, maybe there's it's simpler than it than it looks, but. Um, I mean, like the, the 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 pictures and the diagram show like trees and lighting and you know, you know that'd be great for any street. Doesn't need a special program if we can get it funded and you know proposed and funded. Then fantastic. Um, the the you know, the we have streets that get closed like on weekends as part of the uh, you know the street closure programs. The photos that show like people out in the street and enjoying it. Seems to see a lot of kids. You know, so during the day they're in school. Um, you know, after school, I don't, you know, I've, when I walk around there, um, I don't like see games of stickball going on or anything like that. It just seems to be a street that you just, if you're going to drive through, you got to hop out and move the gate. It's kind of an inconvenience. Otherwise it's, it's kind of an empty street. So without the programming, um, you know, so to me, it's almost kind of a no brainer. No. Um, the, the reason, okay. the reason to move those, those, the, the, the gate, I mean, the reason I have that gate doesn't seem to serve a purpose except for those times when other streets get that. So couldn't we just move this from, you know, a whole, you know, street closure, you know, full time to let's get this on one of those weekend street closures like we have on some other streets as a way to right. let people enjoy the open space instead of 
Okay, so when I, when we when we bring up the issue of like timing, I'll, we'll raise that possibility as well at the end of the committee discussion. Um, Alan, did you have one more thing to say, or is your hand up from before? You're on mute, Alan. Are we coming back for more uh, community? Uh, for, I'm, I'm uh, trying to wrap this up, Alan. Community? So if you have something to say, okay. say it now. And okay. We'll can, I, can, can, I, can, I, can I just quote two sentences from someone? This, yes, is from the 20, this is from the 20th Street Black Association newsletter that's written by Eric Marcus. Perhaps it would be more productive to direct our energy toward getting the mayor to develop a citywide program for reducing the impact of car travel overall, rather than fighting with each other over whether one block or another should be closed or open to traffic. This is a much bigger issue than one block in Chelsea. Thank you. I mean, that, that puts a finer point on your initial argument about a more comprehensive look at the situation, absolutely. Uh, Jesse then, Veer Brett, is your hand back up or is it up from before? Okay, Jesse, then um, Aaron, then we're gonna close out committee discussion. Great, I'll, I'll be quick uh, uh, and to, to say, uh, uh, you know, definitely in support of looking at a more comprehensive plan and, and options A and options B, but when it comes to what to do immediately about the barricades, I really do believe they need to come down. I do think they are a safety issue every single time. I, I live on 21st between 7th and 8th. Every single time I'm walking home on 8th, there is a car stopped in the middle of the crosswalk abutting out into 8th Avenue, blocking traffic with pedestrians either going around, behind, or in front. The, so whether people live or are trying to get to that parking garage or not, cars are purposely stopping there to use 22nd Street as a cross street. They don't care about the barricade. They will stop. They will move the barricade. They will not put it back. But while they're sitting there, it is so dangerous. They are leaving their kids in the car. It's just not working right now. And I do think until a long-term solution can be found, the barricades need to come down. Thank you. Okay, great, Jesse. Thanks. Do we have a, do we have any more discussion from the committee? Uh, I just want to make a quick point. I think uh, if the city doesn't do a comprehensive plan, may, maybe the community board might find ways of sort of doing so far. Yeah, this. we've done stuff like that where we take on a special project and we do have yeah. some. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. That'll I think be, that I think, effective. yeah, bookmark that because that'll be in our kind of more comprehensive list. We're going to get to the issue of like hours, but let's go to, I haven't even looked at how many attendees have their hands up. I We have 18 people, 20, we have, no, we have a lot, we have a lot of hands up. I don't, I'm not going to count them right now. Uh, Janine, bring people over a couple at a time. I'm going to beg the public members because of the time that we have spent on this issue and the time of night it is to be concise and do not repeat a point that's already made just say i agree with the prior point dale uh, can i make, can, can i suggest that we do a, ti a time limit yeah we're public? gonna do a time limit yeah, yeah we're just gonna give everyone a minute at this point yeah okay janine okay uh, so it's you... paul pamela and karen yeah evening everyone um paul crickler i'm fully in support of this open street and others in the city Something somebody said at the very start, this was very interesting to me. Somebody said, what's the benefit? Who's the benefit for from these things? And it struck me this person speaking from their own perspective as a car driver. I'm one of the 80% of people in this, this borough who does not have a car. So my perspective is I want that street for calmer, nicer place to live without cars throttling down there, killing people and maiming them. There shouldn't be such a big deal about a barrier temporarily, really people. If I was a car driver, I think I'd be lucky to be able to swap going out and getting a barrier up and down for $600 a month of car parking. It's free parking, people. We shouldn't complain about this. So really, I can't see why we wouldn't want to have five miles an hour cars going down there slowly so everyone has a nicer place to live. I'm fully in support of this. Thanks, Paul. Who's next? Pamela. Pamela. Well, hello there. Um, I love CB4. Thank you for this opportunity. I want to say, I cannot say what I need to say in one minute. So I'm just going to keep going. I thank you for the opportunity. I am Pamela Wolf. I'm speaking on behalf of the 150 member Chelsea West 200 Block Association. Back at the beginning of COVID, we were approached to participate in the city's open street program. 22nd Street, one of the streets offered by the city, seemed a good choice due to the narrowness of the sidewalks and the intense amount of eastbound crosstown car and trucking traffic forced into the block by the bus lane and the turning restrictions that have, were recently installed on 23rd Street. 
In the ensuing two and a half years, it has been a blessing for many and a challenge for those committed to maintaining the gate. When we became aware of complaints from some Chelsea residents inconvenienced by the need to open the gate, we, re we arranged a meeting to discuss ways to ease their discomfort. We offered to shorten the gated time from eight to eight to 10 to four, pending approval from the city program to do so. The now available published report from the visioning workshop held in October makes it clear that the preferred choice going forward is to eliminate the gate instead of in instead including the block in a redesigning by DOT that will have the effect of calming the automotive traffic, discouraging trucking, and vastly improving the street experience of all who live in Chelsea in the neighborhood, work in the community, or simply pass through as tourists. Our understanding is that DOT is presently engaged in planning the layout for the street that allows unobstructed passage as well as calming features and will hold public hearings to introduce those plans to the community. We look forward to their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. And we're gonna we're gonna bookmark your uh, time frame suggestion when we get to that discussion. Who's next? Karen. Thank you so much. I'm a resident and occasionally a car driver. And I also walk to work and walk on errands. I average eight to 12,000 steps a day. So I have a lot of, of experience from all ends of this. I wanna thank every member of the community board for your service. Um, I understand that it is a, a thankless job and difficult and long and I get it and I really appreciate what you are doing for all of the community. I'm a little concerned I'm not hearing um, open mindedness from some members of the community board. It was my understanding that it's your job to represent us and um, it, it makes me concerned that some members seem to be advocating a particular um, Karen, point of view. Karen, do you have a... Do you have a do you have a comment on the actual yes. uh, matter at hand and not our personal mindsets? Yes, of course. Yeah, okay, please. moving on. As a driver, I've had to get out of my car in the middle of the street and while driving in and move the barricades while leaving my car unattended. There is no sense of community safety or security as a result of the, the closing or slowing of this block. The block is empty. It's, it's just a perk for that block. They've had time to make me use of it. And for the most part, it seems they haven't. It. it just makes a quieter street for the people who live on that block. My question is who benefits? Not the majority of residents of Chelsea. After a year or two, the street is still not being used. If funds are the problem, perhaps they could make a plan and present it and, and let us know yeah. what they plan to do. They just um, did. Do you have any? Uh, they said they're they're applying. They just for made funds a plan and, and presented it. I'm going to move on to the next speaker, Karen. Thank you. You just made my point. Thanks. Sure thing. Okay. Uh, uh, does anyone have a comment that hasn't been heard, or if you want to just plus one somebody who's already spoken, please go ahead. Who's hey. next? Hey everybody. Hey, thanks. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'll be really quick. Um, I really love the open street. I walk there. I bike there. Uh, I think it's awesome. I just want to push back on the notion that it's dangerous. Uh, I think that's kind of laughable. Um, I looked at Crash Mapper for CB4 over the last 10 years, and your your community board has 44 fatalities, uh, 30 pedestrians, eight motorists, six cyclists. You have 6,534 injuries, 3,092 of which are motorists, 2,271 pedestrians, and 1,171 cyclists. So I just... Uh, you kind of missed me with the argument that it's dangerous um, and just as a spatial equity issue, vast majority of people don't have cars. We need our space too. And with that, thank you. Thank you so much. Who's next? Dylan. Sorry? Dylan. Dylan, are Hi, you yeah. with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly just going to plus one what Brock just said. Um, there aren't that many residents with a car. I, I don't live in the neighborhood, but I do work there. Um, and, you know, there's already agreement on eliminating the gate. And there's a lot of discussion about programming, but it sounds like from the polling or the, the workshops that a lot of people just like having a calmer street. 
And that is the end goal. And that's what they're pushing for. So it's not just about being able to use it as a playground, but just having it be nicer, having it be calmed and having slower traffic through without a barricade, which seems to be what everyone wants. Well, uh, sorry, without a barricade has everyone in agreement. And I didn't particularly hear many arguments against having that calming in place before it happens. Um, If there are concerns about the barricade blocking the intersection, I wonder if the barricade can just be nudged slightly back. um, So it's still visible, uh, but you know, cars aren't stopped in the intersection. Um, But other than that, it seems like it's worthwhile to have the barricade in place. Thank you for that suggestion, Dylan. We're gonna factor that into our wrap up. Thank you. Okay, next. Janet, hi. Uh, thank you. So um, the new, 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 new points are one. A few, few members have discussed that you want a comprehensive plan from DOT. I, um, I actually serve on community board too, but I did actually help facilitate the program, the uh, workshop. I want to say comprehensive is a great idea, but that's not how the city works. And if we want to wait a decade or two, maybe you know. But I, I think. Uh, that's it's nice conceptually, but rather the way the city works is they take a street and they prototype it. And ideally, if it works, then it's replicated. And the question why this street is sort of why not this street? I mean, it's just a quintessential street. So what could be done here is then therefore what could be done on thousands of streets throughout New York City, because that's kind of, you know, so that's this is, this is somewhat of the test case. Exactly. Okay. You know, and 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 um uh and the only thing is as I say, I did leave the workshop, one of the, the the breakout sessions. Uh the people on my group were not on the street, they were car owners. There was a consensus, yes, that the barricades were clumsy, and then there was also a consensus about all the other lovely things that could be added to the street. Thank you. Thank you so much. Who's next? Will. Will. We're looking for. Hi, can you hear? Me? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Will. Hi, um, I wanted to just plus one what Brock and Paul and a lot of the other comments that, uh, that people have said. The one thing I would like to add is that people against the open street mentioned a lot about emergency vehicles like taking time to open the barricade. But if the open street was removed, um, you see all the time in Manhattan the the emergency vehicles are stuck in traffic on the cross streets. So. <laughs> Um, I, th- I think it actually, if you did an analysis, it would actually speed up the response time on that block for vehicles. <laughs> It'd be stuck um, behind UPS trucks if it was, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the only uh, additional feedback. Thank you for Okay, that's listening. an interesting Thanks. point. Okay, who's next? Thomas. Thomas. Yes, hi everybody. My name is Thomas Tierney. My nickname is Trett. I'm a 62 year old longtime survivor of AIDS. I've lived on this block since 1989. Uh, New York City was built on activism. Uh, I almost lost, I am for, so for this because I almost lost my life on February 19th, 2022. An Uber Eats driver, Andrix Suarez, tried to kill me multiple times with his car. And uh, I wound up on his hood twice. He shoved me to the pavement. He tried to stab me. And this is because of mercenary greed. He's an Uber Eats driver. Um, uh, 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 Chelsea is not based on hate. Chelsea is based on honoring each other's lives of agreement and acceptance. Hearing, hearing, uh, hey faggot, want to take a picture of my dick? Or hey faggot, want to get cut? You're going to get cut. Is not, is okay. not acceptable. Thomas, um, I appreciate your experience, but can you keep it germane to the topic at hand? Yes, I can. Um, I, uh, Look forward to the to having a, a more uh, inclusive street, not to be bullied by people, not to be uh, 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 bullied by uh, uh, DA Bragg. Um, I listen to my uh, my 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 ADA, who didn't. Uh, so what I what I need is help. The Anti Violence Project didn't have resources to help. Okay. Thomas, I'm going to stop you because we really need to stay on topic. I appreciate the comment. I am on topic. Made, I? I, you're not on topic at this point. Um, okay, well, let me get on topic. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to say that you add to the voice that 
I feel that this is personally in a very unfortunate situation because you have Chelsea versus Chelsea neighbors fighting with each other over right. something that should be a point of agreement. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next speaker because I, I, I think, you're, I think you're, what you're asking for is not on topic right now. I, I need to ask the next speaker from the community Janine. board. I need to ask for help from the community yes, board. We'll get. Uh, please contact Janine or Jesse, and we'll we'll talk to you about your issue. Thank you, sir. Sure. Christina. Oh, you did your thing. Right. Christina. Yes, I'm sorry. I was on mute. I apologize. It's okay. Thank you for giving me the opportunity since I was unfortunately not given for the last meeting, even despite signing up. Um, oh, sorry about that. Thank you. I, I, I do appreciate it. I have been a resident for over 20 years. I am immunocompromised. I have had cancer multiple times. And this street has basically saved my life during this time period. There's no access to open spaces for me in regards to private, like having a space where you can just go. And this street has given me that plus community. I have met neighbors that I have never met. I'm a therapist and I understand what trauma does to the body. And I think that part of what needs to be assessed is in creating open spaces for our city, are we assessing trauma and the long-term effects on education, income, all of the things that trauma affects in us? I know that some people have made some comments in regards to like 21st Street has not been used for a public uh, program. You might want to look up the Opera Next Door, which I attended personally on 21st Street. But what was problematic about that was that the cars were still flying by us as we're trying to watch an opera on one of the most gorgeous nights in New York City this summer. I know that some people are saying like, well, will people come? People go to friggin' Central Park. Like <laughs> people will come. It's like the, you know, field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. I think it's interesting that somebody mentioned Icon, the, the company that has forced forgers out of our neighborhood and the damage that that has done to our community. And I just would like people to think about how we can do this in a way that is kind to each other. I appreciate your comments and I think we'll capture the feedback that you gave about this being beneficial to people with limitations or disabilities or immune. Yes. And in living here, I have to tell you, I, I have to go to Sloan Kettering on a regular basis. I have never once had a problem getting an Uber. I've never once had a problem getting a package. So I'm very you're, confused. You're on the block itself. 250. Okay, great. Thank you for your um, comments. We're going to move on to the next speaker. Just because. Thank you for the time. No, I appreciate it. Who's next? Emily. Emily. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Emily, um, and I really, I first, I want to echo what uh, Janet and Brock and so many others said, and um, I fully support the open street. And you know, as mentioned before, I've, a lot of people don't have cars here, and you know, it would make the streets safer overall and more pedestrian friendly. Um, I was able to attend the workshop back in October, and I thought that it was very informative and collaborative, and um, it was really a chance to highlight the importance of these open streets. Many people were able to tell their stories of how it impacted them. And um, yeah, so I support it. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, who's next? Andrea. Hello. Andrea. Yes, hello. Uh, my name, how are you? Thank you for allowing us to speak for over such a long period of time. Anyway, my name's Andrea Peterson. I live downtown. I'm a cyclist and I'm a pedestrian and I love open streets. And I agree with all the people that have just spoken. I am a little upset with the people that gave the first presentation because it seemed so much, they were considering the 12% of people who own cars in the neighborhood rather than the majority who are walking. And that I don't understand. And they put cars and driving before people walking on the street. And we've just heard that wonderful comment from the woman that just spoke. This is what I really don't understand. And I think it's something that really does have to be considered. And in addition to that, even people, fire department, postal workers, 
actually love the open streets. It makes their jobs easier because there's less traffic. So there are so many pluses in this program. And why do another study when you've got a program that started and it's like 80% there, just continue and make it better and do more of it. And I thank Melody and thank all you. the people that have worked on that. So thank, thank you. you. for your comments. And we'll, we'll seek to capture your comments about the postal workers and the yes. environment. Uh, who's next? Aaron. I'm sorry, Hi. Aaron? Aaron. Yeah, Hi. Aaron, go ahead. Hi, my name is Aaron. Uh, also like Tom, I'm an architect for over 40 years uh, working in this city on urban design and planning. Uh, and lived on 22nd Street for over 30 years. And as we all know, Open Streets was an experiment that started uh, during the COVID period. It was a fantastic experiment. By definition, though, some experiments fail. And I believe that the 22nd Street experiment happened to fail. What I do not understand at all is that both groups completely agree that the gate is a problem, a large safety problem. And in fact, this morning, I witnessed a truck making that turn on 8th Avenue on 22nd Street. And because of the potted plants that DOT put there, the truck could not make the turn without backing up into traffic on 8th Avenue and doing a swing around the other way. So I have absolutely no understanding how anyone could think and at both groups, everyone agrees that the gates are a, a security problem, a safety problem, which it is. How is it other than a political move to want to keep the gates there temporarily for shared streets? Shared street is a beautiful idea. It's a fantastic idea. I'm all for it. It should be designed by engineers and traffic engineers and all the people who do that, not a bunch of citizens around a round table. And okay. let's let professionals Thank do their job and Thank get rid of the gates. Comment. Thank you for your comment, Aaron. Who's next? Paul. Paul. Hello, Paul, are you with us? Oh, he's coming over now. Paul, you're on mute if you're, yeah. You're back on mute. Hello, Paul. I don't know how that happened. Here I am. Hi, yes. Paul. Thank you very much for taking my, my comment. And thank you to thank you to the committee for all that you're doing. This is really great stuff. And I just want to I'll be real quick here. I think that the report by the 22nd Street um, Block Association on their open streets to shared streets um, plan here is a great plan. And I hope it passes because I want to be able to use it as a model to bring to my street here in Chelsea. Thank you. That's all. I'll thank you. Paul. Who's next? Matthew. Matthew. Matthew Friedman, can are you with us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for letting me speak. I'll be fast. I just want to say that this is a horrible street to close for many reasons. The city needs our river-to-river -river crossings. We cannot cross, cars cannot cross comfortably on 23rd Street because of all the buses. They can't cross on 24th Street because of Madison Square Park. And then once you get to 26th Street, traffic is crazy already because of Penn Station. This is not just about, they say, the 12% of residents in the area, but how about the people who aren't residents, who are there for work, who, the Ubers, the Lyfts, the yellow cabs, the people who are driving down that street because they have deliveries to make. You're, make, you're creating a very, very dangerous situation. People on the, who like it say that they need their space. Well, there's a Chelsea Green Park on 20th and 8th, with, which is open to adults. There's huge Madison Square Park just a few blocks away. There are many, many places with space. Tom talked a lot about 63 people attending the meeting, but that doesn't mean all 63 people were in favor of it because I was there and at my table of eight, seven of us were against it, okay? And there was okay. no opportunity for anyone to speak. The petition went up a thousand people, over a thousand people in just a yes, few months. Yes, we're aware. Matthew, um, do you have any more? And everyone agrees that the barrier is an awful, awful situation. Yes, and this has all been established, Matthew. Do you have anything new to add? Otherwise, I'm going to move on. Otherwise, I'm going to move on. Say, Let's remove it as soon as possible because everything Jesse said about the barrier being dangerous is true. Um, and let's figure this and out long term on, while please. the other side wants to keep a dangerous situation. I walk down by that barrier at least Thanks, four times Matthew. a day because my daughter's Thank you preschool. For your comments. And every single day, almost every minute, there's something dangerous going on there, and Thank which you, everything they said is true. It's speaker. a ticking time bomb and people are arguing and fighting 
the gate needs to be removed as soon as possible. And then we can- You made your point, Matthew. Solution. Thank you very much. Bernard? Janine, yeah. Okay. Very quickly, yes, and, uh, as brief as possible. To slow down traffic is put in speed bumps. A, B, remove the gates so there's no problem with backed up trucks, et cetera. And I don't understand why the open streets are not located adjacent to blocks that have parks on them. That's where people socialize. That's where people play. That's the purpose of parks in the city. Not a street, not a, a, a transportation system that is being used to move traffic through the city. You use parks, okay. you socialize Thanks. in museums, you visit people in theaters. All right, this All right Bernard, thank you very thank much. You. This point has been made repeatedly. Thank you. Oliver? Um, sorry? Oliver? Hi, Hi Oliver. Hi there. Um, so I, I just really quickly want to speak out in support of the park. I mean, like, I think people are mentioning that, you know, this barricade might be a safety issue. And I agree, it's not a, it's not a perfect solution. But I think you're conflating an imperfect design with the need to remove it completely. Everyone, most people here seem to agree that the benefits of an open park, quietness, more space, less traffic are worth it. And no deaths have been caused by an opening or a closing of a gate. Whereas deaths have been caused by cars speeding down the road going 25, way faster than 25 miles per hour. Um, you know, I think somebody, I, I think it was Dylan proposed a solution, just moving the barricade back a few feet, you know, that could easily solve the problem. This isn't rocket science. And I think other people have mentioned, you know, like traffic, you know, you should open the street because cars need to get through. <laughs> but I, I, I think what this is missing is that traffic doesn't go away just because you're adding additional lanes, right? Like everybody can see in Houston, they have 20 lane highways, yet their traffic is, up, is as bad as ever. So just opening up the street will magically solve traffic problems. It's not going to make UPS deliveries or whatever any easier. And I think a lot of people, I mentioned that, you know, they have no problem getting deliveries on the street. So I really would appreciate if people kept the street just for, you know, all the benefits that everyone has listed. Thank you. Thanks. Who's next? We Lori. Lori. Please go ahead. Yes. Hi. I have a couple of things. First of all, you say that a lot of people don't have cars. Well, I do. And I park on the street. And when I have packages that I need to load into my car, it's very convenient to pull up near my, my apartment building. I've been living there for 45 years. In addition to that, it's hard to find a parking space. And the proposal A eliminates most of the parking spaces on that, on that block, which is, I very much oppose that. Secondly, all the places you want people to sit, if you ever park a car on that street, did you ever notice how, the, how many um, birds poop on your car? Well, I'm not sitting on a bench that's got poop on it or having a bird poop on my head. So the benches are kind of stupid. Okay, thanks for your comments, Lori. Appreciate You're welcome. I wonder how Matilda. the parks manage all that. I'm sorry, Matilda is next? Matilda. Hi, Matilda Sampson. I'm a 35 year resident of Chelsea. I live on the 300 block of 22nd Street. Uh, and I am opposed to this this street uh, being an open street program. I don't believe that it is a benefit to all residents. It's only a benefit to that block mostly. Uh, I attended that workshop that was referred to, and there was no asking really how, where you're in support or not. So just because we attended doesn't mean we were in support of what was being proposed there. So I, I want to re register that that's not even counting 60 people in that workshop does not mean 60 people were in favor of keeping the street the way it is. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Mathilde. Who's next? Kenneth. Kenneth. Are we getting close to the bottom of the list, Janine? Oh, we have 10 more. Oh, geez. Okay. All right. I'm going to beg the remaining 10 people to keep it concise and not redundant. After Kenneth is Spencer. Kenneth. Kenneth. Mm -hmm. Kenneth, are you oh, with can us? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry about that. Uh, thank you for everything you guys do. Uh, I am all for removing the barriers, as we talked about. It seems like that's that's coming along, um, coming along at a later date. But has anyone noticed the traffic on 20th Street and 23rd Street? 20th Street, which is a cop 
is a cop block, as we all know, which is where I live. That traffic is crazy. And as soon as you start going over 7th Avenue to the other side of 20th Street, you have Kleinfelds, all of these stores, especially on a Saturday and Sunday, people park outside their limos. Park. It's just impossible to go through. So that's just one of my uh, reasons why I think it's the quote that shouldn't have an open street there. And um, also, and if you're using 22nd Street, uh, if it were open, it's a lot of commercials. It's, it's a lot of commercial buildings past 7th Avenue. So once you go past 7th Avenue, it's like a, it's a good throughway all the way so that's all i have to say i just think okay. um, somebody mentioned the one thing about the cops are being a favorite i had an unofficial poll i spoke to five cops that i did not know and they say they don't like it, the open street program on 22nd street only because it seems like there's more cars in front of us in, when we're trying to get out thank you thanks spencer thank you very much um I appreciate your, the patience and the time. Um, I represent the parking garage that's on the block, sure. which is, you know, we're essentially the only commercial business that's on the block. And we're pretty much locked into that location. It's not like we can move to another one. And the limited access restrictions on the block have forced us to lay off half the workforce at the garage, to close the garage overnight. And most of the people with monthly spots in the garage are, of course, residents in the area who are now inconvenienced. We have a landlord with a lease. We, we have no choice but to cut these costs to try to stay afloat. Um, so we would be very much in favor of ending the open streets program or at the very least removing the barricades right away. It does seem that there's consensus to that, but what was not clear to me earlier was exactly what the timing is on that. It seems that there's a long road to implementing some of the alternatives we're fine with people driving at a limit of five miles per hour. That's in everyone's interest, as long as the cars can still get down the street because we're still trying to operate a business. I understand a parking garage is not the most sympathetic business, especially compared to some of the other residents in the area, but we have been in, in business for you know, over 15 years and we'd like to continue to, to stay afloat. Well, I mean, Spencer, I just wanna say, we're happy to hear from you directly because your position has been represented by third parties and I'm glad to have your direct uh, comments on this matter. So thank you. Well, like I said, I very appreciate the opportunity to speak and of course will be available. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, who's next? Cindy. Cindy. Uh, I have a question to Spencer. Could I? May oh, I of course. Question? Sorry, Spencer. Yeah. Cindy, just one moment. Right. Spencer, um, what are the uh, most active times for the parking? So, well, Prior to the pandemic, the garage was open 24 seven uh, as a cost cutting measure um, during, the, during the pandemic. It's now open uh, 5 a.m. to midnight, which is how the staff was also reduced. Uh, I, don't, I could probably get the statistics on exactly which hours are the most transient customers. If you were looking at that in terms of potentially limiting the limited access hours, I don't have those right. numbers right. readily because available, like, but we do like have that kind of data. Yeah, could you ballpark it for us? Like, is it busy in the mornings? I just don't, I, 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 those numbers exist. I just don't have them. Okay. My fingertips. I'd be happy to supply them to the committee. No. That would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Cindy, you're up. Sorry. Um, I just want to uh, echo other comments that the issue is the block. And I think there has to be a lot of thoughtful input on this particular block. So I'm echoing this. I think the idea that it is beneficial to all is a misnomer. It's not beneficial to all. It's beneficial to a few. And it's almost, I feel like I come from places with gated communities and New York City is not a place I think of as having gated communities. And I feel a little bit like this is a benefit to 22nd Street residents who want their own quiet street. It's unique, but why this block from both bad and good reasons. And I just, I think this has to have a lot of more thought about it. It's not, you know. Thanks, Cindy. Yeah. Who's next? Samir. Samir. Hi. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. I was walking home, so I'm joining you from Times Square. Um, I just wanna say uh, I'm a big supporter of the open street. Um, you know, I think residents, not just residents who live near parks, but res uh, residents who live all over the city deserve to have open spaces. The main comment I want to make that's separate from anything everyone said so far 
is that I, I personally disagree with the need for programming. The goal at the end of the day should be to make every street in New York a complete street for the safety of everyone, pedestrians, bikes, vehicle access, and more. And people will use the open street when they know they can and it's safe. I was a volunteer on the University Place Open Street for many, many months. We had zero programming at all. Uh, we simply had the barricades act as chicanes to slow down the traffic. And people walked in the street because it was clear. There were people with dogs, babies, elderly on mobility devices, wheelchairs, and more. And I think this idea that we need uh, programming is, is honestly a little bit misguided. Like we just need streets where people can feel safe walking in the middle of the street. And a street that has a barricade that, or that slows people down to five miles an hour will do the job. And a street that has people going at 25 miles an hour simply won't. So I'm in support of anything that's gonna slow down the traffic. I understand the issues with the barriers. We should get rid of it, but only after we have uh, permanent things in place that will keep traffic going slowly. Thank you. Great, thanks for your feedback and for your live shot from Times Square. Uh, who's next? Joshua. Joshua. Where's your live shot from? It better be good. <laughs> Joshua, can you hear us? Joshua, you're on mute if you're looking to speak. After Joshua is Valerie. Uh, we're gonna go to Valerie. We'll come back to you, Joshua. Hi, Valerie. Can you unmute? Hi, yeah, hi. hi. Thanks for everything. Um, I know it's a long night. Um, I'm in agreement that it's a great idea, but it's the wrong street. Um, um, and I have um, a little bit of question about what the difference is between an open street and a shared street. There seem, I, this I get I I think you know taking and figuring this out this five miles an hour does that mean it closes sometimes or it doesn't close sometimes I'm a little I was a little unclear on that because if it was it was five miles an hour and it was open until we can figure this out I think that's kind of, that's a great idea and to study it further like has been suggested by like Alan and some others so we're I think we're kind of on the right track I know it doesn't seem like it but but thank you all. Appreciate it, Valerie. <laughs> Back to Joshua. Joshua, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, until Joshua sorts out his... Uh, oh, Joshua, can you hear me? Who's next? Roberta. Joshua, we'll circle back to you. Roberta. Hi, welcome. Hold on one sec. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, so I am a Chelsea... Mm -mm. Uh-oh. Uh um, Roberta, your your connection is um, very And I really pushed into this open street. I'm, gotcha. Can you hear me now? Your connection's pretty unstable. Can we circle back to you in a couple of okay. minutes? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll try you back. Uh, Josh, were you live? No. Who's next? Inga. Inga. Are you with us? I am, thank you. Hi. Um, I just wanna say that open streets, shared streets, fine. 22nd Street is the wrong street for this. It is, as everyone said, it's one of the only through streets. It's one of the only streets where you can actually make a left-hand turn uh, going across town, coming off the FDR, uh, the uh, West Side Highway. Um, there's a garage on it. I know you spoke to the person from the garage. Their business is down. They've reduced, they've cut their staff in half. You well, we've, heard, heard we've heard it. directly from the garage. So you don't, you don't Correct. need to address it. Correct. So, so please move on. Okay. Um, I'll add those seconds. Thank you. Um, okay. Programming or not. Sometimes you're for programming. Sometimes you're not for programming with an open street. 21st Street is an ideal open street because they have actually done a lot of programming. Two and a half years, there's been nothing on 22nd Street. It has caused nothing but traffic, problems, and more traffic. It's, there's no one walking on the street. I live on 23rd. 23rd Street has one lane. It now has sheds from the open restaurants program blocking one of the bus lanes. So the buses are in the traffic lane. So closing 20 street is just compounding an issue that's already happening. The barriers are the worst. You cannot drive there. You have to leave your car in the middle of 8th Avenue. I just don't understand why 
Okay. Anyone doesn't understand that you shouldn't have to leave your car to drive down the street. I okay. walk, I drive, I take taxis and Ubers. Ubers and taxis will not stop and even let you as a passioner out to move a barricade. All right. I've seen elderly people, I walk there all the time. I'm constantly helping them move the barriers. I leave them open when they drive through so the next car can get through without an issue. Okay, it's great. Really, Thanks. The, Thanks for your You're testimony. interrupting me and I, no, I I'm just trying to I'm just trying to move you, but you're interrupting me. You've heard again. your comments already. You've been sort of snippy to everyone, Dale. Please. I'm just trying to get listen, Inga. You I know would like to we're all volunteers me. and it's almost 10 o'clock and you haven't contributed get on BLP. Else. We're on till eleven. Dale. It's part of it. We have been here late before. This is important. At full you board, major, you have people you have major speaking points. in it. Do you have any I have not, points? I do. It's a bad idea. The barriers should be removed immediately. It's not a good idea. Yeah, we've heard that yeah. already. Thank you very much. Who's next? Andrea. Please, please, for the remaining few speakers, please do not monopolize and grandstand. Please make your points and move on. And if they've been made already, just plus one them. Thanks. Joshua? It's not there. Okay, who's next? Uh, Roberta or um, Andrea? We heard from Roberta. No. No, her, her internet was messed up. Oh, right, Roberta, is your internet better? Uh, you let me know. Can you hear me? Yes. Amazing. Okay, so I'm going to make this quick. I personally am supportive of this sh sh open street. I helped facilitate um, the workshop or one of the sessions at the workshop, and I acknowledge some of the complexities and the problems here. I'd like to plus one what Janet said earlier about some of the other uh, positive redesigns of the street, contributions to the street. I'd also like to echo the points that Samir and Oliver made earlier tonight. Uh, it's good to slow traffic. Uh, cars are dangerous and it can be helpful to figure out a good way, a productive way, perhaps a compromise to figure out how to slow traffic on the street. Thank you guys for your attention to the issue. Thanks. Do we have any more speakers? Uh, yeah, Andrea's not moving over, but we have Ganesh. Ganesh. Where's my, where am I? Where am I? Hello. Uh, wait, I'm sorry, just one second. Uh, is that Joshua? No. Should I mute myself? Are you are you here to speak on this topic? Who are you asking? No, Ganesh. Okay. She's Ganesh, go oh. ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I'll be quick. Um, I, I'm definitely on the side where I agree that the barricade should be removed. Um, I feel they're pretty unsafe and I feel pretty bad that they're damaged oh. because they're on the street. So, and I will echo pretty much most of the other points the, that side has made. Thanks, Ganesh. Okay, now we have somebody who's not Joshua. Or... Sorry, I don't know why my partner and I both have, have both logged okay. on. Okay, anyways, but so... you're with us, so that's yes. what matters. Sorry, Candace Worth, I'm a resident of the block just east of 22nd between um, a, uh, 7th and 8th, which is trying to be shut down. I am totally opposed to the barriers. I've lived in New York for downtown New York for over 50 years, kids, dogs. I really feel that this neighborhood does not benefit from that street in any way being closed off. We have Madison Square Park, which I, by the way, fully financially support. Uh, you have the West Side Highway. You have so many other opportunities for people to gather and relax and spend time. The pandemic is mostly over. We are all back running businesses, working. We are all functioning in New York City. And to close off these blocks and inconvenience people the way that we have all been inconvenienced in this neighborhood neighborhood is honestly, I don't even know how this was passed. It is so unbelievable what I see happening at that gate, that closed off gate at 8th Avenue, the fights, the stopping in the middle of the street, the blocking of traffic coming forward. Uh, it is, there are so, so, so many people who are upset by this. 
And I know that this is like a very organized group who have proposed this. And I'm not opposed to beautifying the street. But honestly, you're talking about a benefit to so few people that has inconvenienced such a huge amount of people who live in the neighborhood. And it's become this sort of classist thing. Well, you own a car. You shouldn't be able to drive there. Whatever. That's absurd. There's Uber. There's taxis. There's bicycles. There's uh, okay. delivery. All of these people. Candace, just so you know, we've we've heard these points. Before. I understand, but you allowed me to speak for a minute. And no, I'm no, telling you I'm just I saying. I'm just saying right. we want to wrap it up because it's late. Thank and you very much for allowing me to captured speak. Captured these opinions already. Thank so you. Thank you. Okay. Bridget. Bridget. And again, I'm going to ask if you agree with previous speakers, just say that. If you have an additional point to add, please make it. Bridget. There's a second Matthew Friedman. I'm going to bring him over. I'm not sure if it's the same one who spoke earlier. Well, let's try that. <laughs> um, Matthew or the person, the person in Matthew's box. Hi, take your, uh, you're on mute still. Sorry, I'm actually Amanda Friedman. How are you? Hi. Good. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, I just wanted to say I wanted to plus um, what Jesse said, what Candace said before. I'm part of many moms groups in Chelsea. I, my daughter goes to the school on 22nd Street and pushing, pushing her in the stroller. I sometimes have to move the barricade. It's very, very dangerous, extremely dangerous. Um, I'm part of many moms groups. I'm also a teacher myself. And even the school I'm teaching in, many of the the residents are Chelsea residents. They don't believe in the barricade either. I'm happy to speak more about all of that, but as a community Just, member- can I, have a, can I have a point of clarification? Is the barricade yeah. on the sidewalk when you have to move it or in the street? It's on, so when I have to move around, the, so I have to move around those like big, huge planters when I'm- are they obstructing when I'm the going sidewalk? Around. Or are they They're obstructing? obstructing the whole pathway, like everyone, because cars are moving the barrier, and then I have to move around. It's it's a it's a real, it's it's almost a, a game of like Tetris <laughs> in the okay. morning. All right. Okay. So, so it's really it's really difficult as as a commuter mom, and I live on twenty second on three sixty on twenty second on the three hundred block. Um, okay. Many of our neighbors are not in favor of this either. You know, it's, I understand that the 21st street open street, I get that. I get the, you know, uh, PS 11, beautiful place for an open street, but it just seems silly. Okay. okay. So, that's so, all. Yeah, so thank you for that input. Yeah. And we've captured that general opinion, but it's clarifying that you have that encounter with the stroller. Okay. Yes. So is anyone else okay. signed um, up? We have Diana, and then the rest already spoke. Okay, Diana. Um, hi, I'm uh, Diana Mora here, in uh, also in Chelsea. I just wanted to make a fast comment. Uh, this was on Twenty Second Street. This was started as an experimental uh, program, and being that it's an, an experiment, I believe it's it, it. Instead of just canceling it, it's it's worth further experimentation. And my several people have said about uh, the traffic coming down Eighth Avenue. When a second or third car, it were um, how I, I I guess what I want to say is, if perhaps if the barriers were moved, perhaps to 10, 12 feet further east, then yes. uh, wouldn't be blocking the crosswalk and would yes. Move that point out. that point was made by another speaker. I'm glad you're endorsing it. Okay, thank you. That's all I need to say. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, we've had a robust discussion. We've covered a lot of topics. Um, there's a letter in here somewhere which captures the um, community opposition, the community support, the mixed views of the community on this topic that captures uh, uh, the community board's request based on the feedback we've heard from community members to have a comprehensive look at the open slash shared streets programs in our district to identify uh, the best blocks for it. We've had um, a suggestion to move the barricades in from the corner. Uh, we've had uh, so, you know, questions about timeline as far as like if 
if this uh, open street wants to convert to a shared street, what would the timeline be like? Uh, we've had, um, we, we, you know, the, the discussion has captured numerous community concerns with the, the barricades. Obviously, one thing that was made clear from the outset is almost everybody is does not like the barricades and wants to see an alternative solution. Uh, Christine, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, I'm, I'm just from a procedural standpoint, I was wondering whether um, you wanted to split the discussion in two pieces. One, which is about the um, kind of recommendation for the redesign of the street. And a second one, which would be, what do we do now, you know, between now and then? And so I think it would make the discussion a little cleaner because, you know, these are two, two different decisions there. So discuss it as a short term approach and a longer term approach. Yeah, and I would start with the long term. I mean, you know, there is this, I don't know, I, it, based on what I've heard, there is a sense that maybe there is more agreement on that. And, um, and, and what, then, can we just poll the, com the committee? What is the consensus view of uh, the long term goal for the street? Is it a is the, option, the option one, A or B, right? A shared street, open street, through street. No, I mean, through street. Through, well, I, don't, I, don't, I can't hear. Uh, <laughs> this is community discussion, Bridget, not, not for the public. The, the public session of the discussion is over. Yeah, it's so, so maybe maybe the discussion could be. So about, Janine, can you just make sure that we're, yeah. Sure. Maybe the first discussion could be about the long term options which have been presented and whether anybody is in favor of any of them. Or based on the divided views that we've heard at this community board meeting, based on the the tenor of the feedback from both parties based on the benefits versus uh, pluses versus minuses, based on the community input we've had on the nature of, um, of shared streets. I have a couple of things that I'll put in here. I, I think the argument that 22nd Street, which is a narrow side, re largely residential in our district side street should be a through street is a little bit weird when the when it's right next to 23rd street well, what yeah you and i you get want that to have... and i get that there's a bus lane on 23rd street but, but 23rd I, street is the well, obvious have, you, have, have yeah. you agreed to the protocol or not because you are jumping into the discussion oh um, i'm sorry right so i don't know whether you are yes you are. i have agreed to the protocol okay <laughs> all right now now you can go ahead i was confused thank you yeah so we're we're gonna get towards like, I, if I if I understand this correctly, the committee is going to discuss what the consensus is on the long term right. destiny of this this segment of Twenty Second Street. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, what, and I think we should the, take a we should take the, a vote on that so that what is the consensus gonna... view? Yeah. Well, so is everybody ready to present yeah, their? Yeah, why, yeah, why do we still have people from the public um, on the screen? Um. I guess Janine will adjust that just as long as it's it's our discussion. They can they can be here, but well, they Janine, can be yeah. Okay, so uh, let's just poll everyone. Like, where do you? Uh, so, so just to answer one question, just to clarify factual stuff, right? I think what the the uh, group presented on the long term and long term could be, uh, uh, I, I mean, you know, the, the, the permanent design of the street. Uh, I don't want to say long term because it implies some uh, timing, but one option was A, which was like a flat, you know, surface with a shared street uh, components. Uh, and rem remember, reminder that the shared street doesn't have a, 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 a gate, right? and a shared street as a limitation of five miles per hour and a shared street as signage, which says it's not a through street. And the shared street look like, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it is made for pedestrian, but obviously it's made for cars to go through it. 
All right, it's, so, open. it's open but, for local traffic and deliveries. Right, right. And But if somebody wants to go through it, they, they can. I mean, you know, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the concept of shared street. And what I heard from them is that three options. One, which is option B, which is a shared street like University Place or uh, Union Square, right? Or one of those places. Uh, a was much more built out with a raised and, and the option C was a gate. So this is, if I summarize, these are the three options. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just clarifying and I'm going away from the discussion. I'm not in the discussion here. Okay, uh, Viren. And just very quick clarification here. I'm, I'm not quite sure if you're, you're ready to vote on a particular design while the larger issue is uh, unresolved. The larger issue is why this block, number one. Number two, do we have a comprehensive study? Do we have the traffic in impact study? And do we have a sort of any sense of agreement uh, within the community that open streets, we all love open streets, I love open streets too. Absolutely, we are all in favor of it. We already saw that. In the first case, we, we approved it. In the second case, there's so much opposition and there's so little information. I, and I think it's premature to discuss design options right now. Okay, uh, Carl? Well, I mean, I don't think we're voting on a design. I think, I think what we would be voting on is, you know, we need to, Right. For, for the in terms of the long term piece of business, we need should we should write a letter to DOT that urges them to begin a open uh, a shared street design process immediately uh, for this block. I mean, this block has been you know uh, very restricted to car traffic for two years. We've seen that you know it, it has been able you know to function in some way as an open street. But after that two years, we've been hearing from the community uh, that you know there are some. Uh, there's some concern about the temporary setup in which the street is operating under, and we think it's in the best in, it's in the best interest of the block to begin a, a shared street process. I mean, I think it's it's that's I think that's the long term answer, and that's I would even make a motion that we write that letter. Okay. Um, okay. Um, there's a motion. Is there a second on that? I second that, and plus what Carl said. Okay. I want to go to um, Blake because he hasn't spoken yet. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Dale. Uh, you know, since it might be a split vote, I just wanted to get on the record that I don't, you know, I would be for the immediate removal of the barriers and turning it into the through street as the default option. I feel like the default makes a lot of difference in how we're perceiving changes to what the default is. And, you know, I think that having an unbiased party, see the city, uh, you know, run more studies uh, around the traffic implications uh, and, you know, whether this in fact is the best street, which had been discussed, uh, you know, would be the best next step. Thanks. Thanks, Blake. Uh, Alan? Hi. So long term, um, I would be more inclined to plan B um, with minimum changes to the to the street. I mean, neck, the neck downs, whatever you call it, or, or the bump outs um, scattered throughout, I would say would would be a preferred option with speed bumps, with the raised um, crosswalk. I don't want, I, personally, I don't want to spend an awful lot of money on a street that is not going to be able to be duplicated somewhere else. Um, okay. So I think we, we need to know maybe from DOT at some point, you know, really how far do they want to go and will, will that go throughout the city, throughout the community? How do you pick a, how do, how do you pick a street to, to do anything? Um, but the way the city is heading, uh, I think we need to do as much as we can for everybody to make these streets calmer and safer for everybody. Okay, thanks, David. Warren. Yes, I agree with uh, Alan that um, we should try to come up with a plan or to, to dot or maybe someone from open plans or some urban planner come up with a plan that the streets can be duplicated. Um, you know, the design just not, it's not just one, it would be, um, but I think at some point we should figure out a, a, a way, whether we do it with, as I said, an urban planner or someone like from Open Plans, how to, how to make these streets the best. 
One option I would not, I would under no circumstances do I want to make it back to a through street. I mean, I'm fine with the other two options, but definitely not making it back to a through street. I think that would be a, a retroactive, it would be a, a reactionary, it would be disastrous. Okay. So, Thanks, David. Thank Charlie. you. Charlie. Yeah, um, I would say if we are discussing the three options very briefly, I think option B is a great option for the short term because it doesn't require a big capital investment. It's as Alan said, it's the neck downs, it's the bump outs. Um, I think if it's successful, then perhaps we would move on to option A as a long term experiment to have an Amsterdam style street. And I would love for us to have Amsterdam style streets in our city. In terms of why this street, I agree that it may seem arbitrary that 22nd Street was picked to begin with, but again, it was picked because there were some local people on the block who, who, who stepped up and volunteered. I think in terms of a study, uh, it's been this way for two years. And while there are there is community opposition specifically around the barricades, it seems as though life is moving on and, and there haven't been notable detrimental effects other than the, this issue with the barricade and some there are other issues that um, people have brought up. And I just want to briefly touch on the status quo of the block. I visited the block on Monday to prepare for this meeting and I was there at about 9.30 a.m. And four days a week on that block between 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. is alternate side parking where there are 30 people in their vehicles idling. And I would say about 30% of the vehicles had out-of-state license plates. So there are people with Florida, there are people with North Carolina, with Massachusetts license plates idling on the street. So in terms of a long-term vision, I would not want to see it maintain the status quo of a through street with free storage of private vehicles. I love the idea of trees, trees and benches and all of that. Great, Jesse. Resident parking permits. Um, I, I think, you know, it, the consensus on this committee is generally, we're right, we all want to move to a city with more shared streets, less car, fewer cars, uh, uh, more, more sidewalk, more pedestrians, more trees. Um, I just think the danger of even accomplishing that goal, though, by by selecting streets to for this experiment based on who volunteers or raises their hand to do it is that could actually set back that goal because it's just it, it, it actually you know, really has increased traffic on the other side streets. We really haven't seen those detrimental what we don't really know what those detrimental effects are. But I promise you, the other side streets are getting more traffic because this one has less and just randomly picking a street to try to like have this experiment play out is actually dangerous to achieving the long-term goal of a city without streets. I, I think we need a better plan in place. I don't think we should just be supporting this particular street, especially when we know it has it's had so many issues. Uh, and so I think for now, my, my vote would be to pause. Okay, Brett, thanks, Jesse, Brett. Thanks. Um... Yeah, I mean, it, it, it sounds like the, the 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 most fundamental difference between making this long term a shared street or not is whether or not it's five miles per hour or not. Um, then, in addition to like taking some parking spaces and putting benches on them. Um, so, if we're talking about actually changing the legal speed limit where someone can get uh, ticketed for driving, you know, ten miles per hour on the street, I would be I would be against that. I think it's confusing when you have a block that's not like um union square where it's clearly a different street i think it's confusing to drivers there's so many signs and regulations already to keep track of um the harder and more complicated driving is the more dangerous it actually gets because um you know I, I will drive around the here every now and then one of my dirty secrets i married someone with the car and um so that's that's one thing so if we're talking about the more um traditional street calming features from an urban design standpoint the neck downs, um, you know, th things like that. Um, I think that's worthy of studying for this street, for any street. Um, that and that I think then moves this whole um, proposal into the Department of Transportation's realm. You know, city planning can help out, but it's it's let's look at let's look at this a little more holistically. Um, what's the impacts? You know, we you, we do know when we when we close one street, it causes uh, um, people who are looking for on street parking whether they're residents, whether they're visiting, just looking for a spot, uh, they need to spend more time driving around the streets. It actually causes more more, more mobile vehicles when they're, when it's harder to find those spots and the volume hasn't gone down. So um, so I think there are, are some consequences that DOT would need to study. Um, rather than, you know, ready, aim, fire, let's, let's change the speed limit on here. Um, I think that's not the right approach at this point without DOT intervening. Um, but uh, right. but if but if it's about right. studying so, streets and making it design well, then yeah, let's do that. 
All right, thanks, Brett. All right, so where are we at? Has everybody spoken on this topic? I see hands still up. I, mean, I made a motion that was seconded, right. so I. Yeah, we need to vote on the motion. Yeah. I, I have a, I have some information on that that I want to add to the discussion. Uh, my understanding is that the uh, West Twenty Second Twenty uh, Second Street, if you go east between Sixth and Fifth Avenue, was an open street and with open restaurants. And now the flat iron building is going to convert that to a uh, slow street and shared street. So I think it's important to understand that this is going to happen in different places. And um, it's- So 22nd Street is not gonna be the through street that right. the exactly. are saying it's going to be. Exactly, exactly. Right. Other people are going to change the nature of the street because they also want a shared street and Flatiron wants to have some slow street as well. And even though this is very commercial, that's what they want because that's what they want to attract people. So-, so that, um, That's fifth and, between fifth and six or between- that's my understanding is fifth Broadway and sixth. Six. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I, I, I just as a context, you know, it seems that uh, DOT is going to study multiple of those before doing them next year. And I'm sure they are going to do the right uh, assessment of traffic before they do that. So, okay, so that, that goes to the point of like a broader assessment of the... No, but that, that goes to the point of saying, well, you know, what Carl is saying is like, maybe we are in favor of provided that they do the, they do the right due diligence, you know? Right, right. Yeah, that's, that, that's right. what I was looking at. Okay. okay. So should we, should we, should we take the, should we take the motion up that's at hand? Yep. Can you repeat it, please? Can I, can I propose an amendment? Oh, go ahead, Jesse. Sorry. No, I just well, can you repeat them? Can you repeat it? Yeah, then... my the, the motion that I proposed was uh that DOT uh should begin a uh you know shared street process for 22nd Street, uh between seventh and eighth and seventh and eighth, right? Right? Yeah. But yeah, it's twenty uh twenty second street between seventh and eighth. Happy to hear. You know, any of the people want to craft that. By process, you mean they start the study and the design, et cetera. Right. right? They do yeah. study what whatever they are doing in order to do those shared streets. With an emphasis on the comprehensive nature of right. their look at the street. Yeah. That yeah. All the points that have been raised by Viren and Alan and others, that it needs to be it needs to be a holistic approach. Yes, if, if someone can rephrase the sort of this uh, motion, I think that would be very helpful. That basically DOT can start the process for shared streets design approach with the caveat that they must have a comprehensive plan moving forward. Yes. And, and necessary studies about the impact. I think I think that's that's what we've been merging towards is a is a study that is as I mentioned, whole, comprehensive and holistic in nature, rather than just like, "Hey, look at this little segment and give us a give us a verdict." Like it has to have the it has to have the. But the but policy. that's but not I don't think, that's not that, what DOT does. <laughs> I mean, we can prod them to 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 have a comprehensive look at the at the conditions. I, I guess my my motion is not dependent on this process of the process starting for this street dependent on whether there's a comprehensive citywide plan right. for for that oh, I don't I, know citywide I was I mean just or even borough wide neighborhood, I mean, neighborhood impacts neighborhood impact oh right, right. okay that's a study. Yeah, okay they, they'll kind of Alan, take a, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if any if anybody had followed um the petition that went around with a thousand signatures that was all over the city but I think it's important for us to come up with a plan that is um equitable for everybody concerned, because I think there's, there's, there's a growing resentment out there, um, not just in this community, but out there where people are, are oh, what's going, on? oh yeah, you know, we didn't, we didn't know that this was going to happen and this and that. So I, I think for the benefit of the program, we need to come up with, you know, a, a plan that is equitable, that everybody's happy with, we move on and, um, you know, just yeah. keep the program, keep the program alive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think okay. it's a great point because you want to keep it accessible. You don't oh, want yeah. to make it sound like sorry. Okay. Okay. So 
I see four hands up still. I'll, I'll hand is so, actually so, up. Yeah, I just had a question on the motion. Wait, yeah. Here, are we taking a stand on what the default option is or just calling for the comprehensive study? Well, the way we set this up, it's kind of we're dividing it into two parts. This is the long our long-term vision or our long-term ask versus the short-term ask addressing the issues that have been raised, particularly around the barricade. But so, Carl, can you, can you answer that question, Carl? Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, the, I mean, my question was just whether the motion is taking a stand on the default option. You know, are we saying that we're doing this study in order to make it a non through street or, you know, an open street permanently? Well, it seems to, to me that the in the, the short term, the open street is <laughs> has some problems. So mine is a sort of a long term uh, goal for the street you know it's not dealing with the immediate concerns of the barricades etc that we heard this evening yeah we're going to take that up separately next after we like see if this motion this mm -hmm. part of the motion or this part of the letter that we'll write is you know a consensus view so it's right time to do a, a, a vote yeah so the motion before us is do we uh, to ask dot take a look at a shared street option for 22nd Street with all the uh, relevant neighborhood studies that are necessary for us to make, a, a, you know, to assess it. Oh, you, say, you have to make. Who's in favor of that? <laughs> Who is in favor of that uh, approach? Yeah. Pete, where is Pete? Pete's Pete Diaz is on the phone. Pete, are you in favor? No, I'm Pete. in favor of it. Yes, yes. I am in favor. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. And so we have like, uh, it looks like a, a majority, if not a, a unanimous. Uh, okay. And then. Present okay. not eligible. Oh, you're um, yeah, this is like present non eligible. Christine's I'm present non eligible to all. David CNA. Okay. And where's and now, David? And now on to the immediate. The like we you know we can say we'd like you to do this in the in the immediate. You know it's been it's been uh, it's been noted that the barricades are presenting a problem. Uh, there was a suggestion made to move them in. There was a suggestion made to um, get to work on. Uh, uh, neck downs. Um, I don't know how immediate that could be, but what is there a motion uh, for how we'd like to address the immediate concerns that have been raised tonight on the barricades and the the condition of the of the open street? I will make a motion that I don't think people will agree with, but I'll at least get the conversation started. Uh, my motion would be to as as until we can you know deal with a long term. Uh, the long-term solution for West 22nd Street uh, to remove the barricades. Uh, uh, and the reason is, um, uh, you know, I, I, well, I, I do hear those compromised positions of moving them back or changing the hours. And I, I, I do, you know, there's obviously reason to them. And, and, and I think they're, they're decent compromises. I, I do really, though, connect with this idea that, you know, we are not a city of gated communities. And, and as it exists right now, just closing this street this lucky, lucky block in the middle of Chelsea and forcing more traffic onto all the surrounding streets. It, it's just patently unfair. And it is a gated community in Chelsea. And on, like, I'm for a shared street vision where we all, all these blocks, and the more blocks, the better that we can, you know, okay. can so have. Okay, so just but, to be clear, is your proposal to remove the barricades? That is my, that is my proposal. Let's see if anyone else uh, supports wait, it. Wait, I'm not done. To re <laughs> your, is your, is your, is your, is your motion to remove the barricades and return the streets to 25 miles an hour? Uh, I mean, if I have the option to return it to five, to um, automatically put up a five mile per hour sign, sure, I do that. But I don't know if I have if that's an option. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I think the problem is we can't we can't immediately just turn it into a shared street. If we could do that, sure, I'd be for that. But I think until we can get that going and until we see the effects on the neighborhood, and as we just talked about. Yeah, I think we need to go back to having the barriers removed and have it just be a normal cross street, cross the street. A, a normal through street. No, so you're 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 advocating for immediate termination of the open streets program on the block. Yes. Okay. 
Is there a second? Yeah, I'd second that. I mean, okay. I've, can I have an amendment? I'm taking comments? Yeah. yeah, that's what we're here for. Yeah. yeah this quick, quick amendment to Jeff's uh, proposal, I mean, uh, the um, motion. Um, unless the community comes up with a plan to staff the barricades, they what? should be immediately removed. To what? What, what did you say? To staff, staff the barricades, to like yeah. man or person the barricades. Oh, yeah. Because then they can they can have what they want, and we can. I mean, the community can have what community wants. It seems like so, that's been a conflict point at, at the barricades. It's like when a person, a volunteer, gets involved, they get into fights with the drivers who want to. I'm, I'm not saying volunteer. I'm saying uh, staffed. Meaning they don't have budget, though. I mean, that's the concern. You know, I, I don't think it's realistic for them to have staff. I think it's. I actually think it's like it would be contradictory to say, return this street to remove the open street program immediately from this block. And I also think, I don't know if DOT works that way. I think they have a, it's like a term that goes until June and then study it as a shared street in some, in some future. So I don't, I, 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 I don't know if I could vote for that. May I right. offer, maybe I'll offer an amendment because I think it's, <laughs> You know, we we also heard tonight from a lot of people who like it, who are for it. Um, you know, we did not just hear that it was a nuisance to the community. So I think instead of going completely in the other direction, that we have some reasonable compromise steps that we could take to try first. I think that <clears throat> we sh they should seriously consider reducing the hours of the open street. I think 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. is way too long. Uh, I think they should, and we can talk about what the hours are. I think something that maybe from like a 10 to four situation or maybe certain days of the week, it's restricted and not open. Um, and we move the barriers back. So I, I or move the barriers back and can't they be stacked? Like when we did these open streets, when they started meatpacking, we, we were trying to, we had the barricades set like this. Yeah, where exactly. it was possible for the car to go like that and come through and it slowed it down. So I'm wondering if we can move the barricades back and also structure them in a way where a car can move through it without having to get out of the car, but still forces it to slow down. And change the hours. Yes. Yeah. I think two things together. Creating okay, a so uh, do we have- can, I have do something we have to add as well. Yeah. And we, we can take this or not, but you know, I, I, I respectfully disagree with some of the comments I heard about programming not being important. Uh, I think you need to sort of teach people who that they can come back into the street. Uh, we've all been trained to stay on the sidewalks and just because it's open doesn't immediately they're going to. So I think in the short term, they should consider and make a plan for some kind of programming. Not may not every day, but on weekends, so then there should be something that helps encourage people into the street to teach people that they can go there. That's all. So those are be my okay. amendments. Regarding the amendment, I'm, um, I'm strongly against making that back into a thorough, thorough, thorough street uh, during the interim period of deciding to make it into a shared street. I love Carl's idea of stacking. That's a phenomenal idea. And if we can get that, that can be done immediately, that stacking thing. And that can be a viable solution temporarily until uh, it becomes a shared street. So I, I think that's the way to go is what Carl was saying with the stacking, that would be an immediate. Okay, uh, so where we're at right now, thanks David, where we're at right now is Jesse has a motion which is basically to remove the barricades and re return the street to a through street. And that was seconded. And then there's an amendment that, you know, substantially modifies that. <laughs> I mean, would you, would you would you accept that amendment or would you want to vote on simply your uh no I, I'm I'm open to that amendment because I I, okay. I want to hear uh so okay, Carl just to clarify where we're at with the um, long with the yeah go ahead. No, I just wanted more information from Carl. Sorry, I because I'm trying to picture it. So you're, it's a, a barricade eff effectively that just slows down the cars at the, the front end but allows them to traverse. Uh, can I, can, right, because like Dale was it's, saying, it's, it's not enclosed. It shouldn't be closed. It's technically not closed to traffic. So if you have, right, it's technically, okay. yeah, there, if you haven't form, formatted, and we did this in meatpacking, 
And right. if you it's have that formatted, Carl, 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 can can I, but you can basically. Carl, can I, yeah, can I, I ask I, a question? Can I, can I, ask, can I, I ask think that's a great compromise. Where, where, where were those stacked barricades in the knee pack? And what street? Oh, 17th Street, which is where Fulton Houses was. That's a wide so, street. So 17th between. That's a wide street. I don't think this is going to happen on 22nd Street. I don't think DOT is going to go If for it's that, wide, right? wouldn't that be. That would 17th, be 17th is narrower, narrow, so wouldn't wide, it be easier? 17 no, but, but how, how's somebody going to manipulate how's a truck going to get through i mean well are trucks even supposed to go down that street no but they do well I mean, this, you know, now they won't. Mean, that's supposed <laughs> to go down all the streets in, in chelsea but they do so i mean let's let's be real about it i mean that's not gonna and the other thing is just moving it back only creates more cars stacking behind it waiting for the guy in the front who's 10 feet in waiting for him to open up and you got three cars behind him so it doesn't open uh, anymore. It's not, so, there's nothing to open. It's like a chicane made out of barricades. Right. I don't know what, I don't know what a chicane is, but it's stacking it is not going to work. It's, you zigzag. The car is going to have zigzag. people yeah. knocking them over. Forces the car to slow down because they have to do this to get through. But, but, I think it could work. How, I do, I how, think wide, could. how wide are you going to make oh, it? I mean, it, it's like, it's like well, not a street I mean, anymore. I mean, no. honestly, like, uh, okay, hold on. I just need it the front. Yeah, let, me ask, let me just ask block. you uh, an operational question. How, how, how soon can DOT put in speed bumps on that street? They, they cannot put a baffle unless they what, remove Do they have to do a whole study spot. and a blah, 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 do that whole thing? Yeah, I don't think that's a quick solution, Alan, okay. as much All as right. And like. Alan, just to point of clarification, I don't mean like down the whole street. I just mean at the at the front. No, no, no. I I, I okay. got that part. I okay, do, I'm sorry. just saying that if you did it on 17th Street, you had a nice wide street to work with. So what you need to do now, if you're going to do that, you have to remove a couple of cars, right? So you need to have no standing. So there is there is a to... there is a loading zone on each side, so you have the space for that, Alan. At the corner. At yeah. The corner? Yeah. Both sides. There's a long loading space at the corner, and the other side is the uh, a fire hydrant. Uh, hey, I'm not Wait, voting so, anyway, so do what you want. So, so, no, 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 I'm just telling you. This is the so, way. So, it. so you're taking away from the no standing. So you're taking away from trucks being able to to, to park there and deliver. You know, it's complicated. I know it's 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 not. In, yeah. You know. Um, Jeff, I mean, I think. This is kind of like, you know, I don't know if, and then we got this, you know. It, you I don't know, know if we no have to. I don't, I don't know. know if we have to engineer this alternative to the nth degree. What we have to say is there was consensus that the barricades as they are right. not work. Mm -hmm. And that we want to consider a, a different configuration that may work better, prevent the backup on eighth right. and make it safer and easier make for it's... cars okay. to negotiate the shared street condition. Yeah, I vote for that. Wait, wait, wait. so they, right. they clear the barrier, then they'd go 20 miles an hour once they clear it? No, no they, it still they says five, five miles, miles an, hour. an hour for the length of the block because that's. I mean, point. once they open it, they're going to go twenty-five. And you know, no, you but I mean, it still it, says it, it, anyway. it's, it's still the rule of 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 the uh, of the open street, which is you know five, five miles per hour. It, it is that, I is mean, that, whether is they that, respect it or not is is that ticketable and enforceable, or it's just a a request? I don't know. Well, it would be enforceable if we put a camera. But this is there. the way I mean, it is today. Yeah, I observe the conditions I observed on Monday is people move the barricade. Sometimes they move it back, sometimes they don't, and then they speed off at thirty miles an hour. So that's yeah, that's the current condition. I think with this compromise chicane solution, it'll probably be the same. So I mean, all, all we'd essentially do is slow down the turn, but but it's still but it, then it's a through street. We're kind we'd of ideally helping. discourage people from making the turn, and there would be the signage. I mean, it would be something. We're forcing them to slow is, down instead I do think of it's a good compromise. Car. I think it's a good compromise. What I about the hours? What are you guys talking about for hours? I wish we had more feedback, both from like the garage operator and and others about the hours. But Can we generally I, ask for a, a reconsideration of of hours. Maybe we can. Yeah. Who who moves the barricades? I mean, the, who moves the barricades into place Volunteers. and out of place right now? volunteers and also like i've done it like i've walked past there and seen a car yeah. going through and just said you know they they move the barricade and then i say to them just go i'm going to move it back for you and they're like oh thanks. You know, my, i guess my question is though if we say like oh we want it from 10 to 5 like is a volunteer really going to remove right. the barricades at five o'clock and put them like is that going to happen well, or that's is that what just they're doing now 
I, I guess the other question is if we, have this, if we have this chicane compromise solution, do we are, are the hours as important? I mean, if it's- I think they are. I think they are. I think they are because it'll address the issues of the business on the block and also like the community opposition, but keep a foothold on the block as a possible, you know, uh, shared street solution long-term. You guys are ready to vote? I am. Okay. <laughs> Can we get a summary? The summary is that in the short, we've had the we've had the discussion of what our long-term suggestions to the DOT are. In the short term, we want to uh, mention that uh, there have been problems with the barricades as they are currently configured. So we are requesting that the barricades, be, uh, a new configuration of barricades, be considered, which are in a essentially forming a chicane at the entrance to the block, pushed back away from the intersection so that cars may slow at, at the intersection at, at, as they turn into the block. And then the hours. And then the hours, which it's currently eight to eight, six days a week. Yeah. Oh, and then honestly, I don't know who it was who talked about weekend hours versus weekday hours. Is that like, do you, what do you, what, what's your take on that, Christine? Should it be a Sunday thing? I don't know. The garage is open all the time. Never on Sunday. No. All right. Well, let's. I think so you not, should pick. I think you sh you guys should pick an hour, uh, some a set of hours, and then add what Carl was talking about, which is the activation, right? If I my my thinking is the garage is probably busier with like arriving uh, uh, people in the mornings, so mm -hmm. like push it push it forward in the morning instead of what, I mean, what time do you start to, now? 10, 10 to 4. I think like 10 to 4 or 5, personally. Yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, 10 to 4 is also like the most daylight. It, there's yeah, a... It's when argument. kids are out from... When kids are kids are home from school, you know, that's that's the time in the middle of the day when, you know, we have people at home with the younger with the younger <laughs> kids. That's that's when the open street, the shared street would be the most beneficial. Right. Um, at night... Are people going to be out there? Maybe in summertime, it's longer hours because we want to, you know, get people out there late. So maybe there's winter hours and summer hours. But I, I can always do dusk. No, but today, today you can oh, make would, a decision. Would, yeah, you can make a decision loud. about winter. And if they want to change the hours, we can have a consultation <laughs> with everybody later on. I think yeah. that's a whole clear yeah. word. Why don't, we just use, use, why don't we just make it at dusk? Well. Why don't we that just solve, make it that a specific summer and summer and winter? Because David, dusk, why don't we make it a specific hour? We were saying ten, 10, 10 to four. Ten, ten to four is great. The thing is, David, <laughs> I I appreciate the interest, but the thing is, like this temporary solution is going to run until June because that's when the the DOT is going to like change the designation or but not. Guys, it's eleven o'clock. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's so put this can to the floor. somebody summarize and vote. The motion is that we're asking DOT to remove the barricades as they exist and reconfigure them in a chicane that's pushed back from the corner and then change the hours from the current six days a week, eight to eight, to six days a week, 10 to four. And the, the participate and the activation. And talk to the applicants about their activation of the street. Right. Second that. Okay. All in favor. Opposed. Yeah. Peonies. We got three peonies on this too, right? Right. Okay. So this is a, I think it's a single letter, but it's got those two, it's got two sections, short term, long term. Yeah, it may be two letters because I think the open street change is more something that goes to the activists, right? Yeah. I mean, whatever, whatever. It's fine. It's the same way. Okay. Is it two letters or is it one letter? Is it? I don't. It's one, is it one to is it one to DOT, and then the other is to the whoever's managing the open street. That's yes. what I think. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the short term letter is to the is to the applicants CCing the DOT, and the exactly. second letter, the long term letter is to the DOT CCing the applicants. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the neighborhood groups that have participated tonight. My God, bravo, Dale, bravo, Jenny.
You guys yeah. are just amazing. Thank you. I'm sorry I popped off at Inga, but that was annoying. And uh, how dare she with the snippy? And uh, and she was only making repetitive comments. Okay. And uh, thank you all for your yeah, and happy no, no excuse happy for being um, snippy. Happy holidays, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Coach. Mr. Thank you. Good meeting, everybody. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy, holidays. Happy, holidays. Happy, New Year. Happy New Year. Good, good creativity from this group tonight. Seriously. Happy New Year, yeah. everyone. It, and happy solstice. That's today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. It's the darkest day of the year. Maybe that's why the meeting had this tenor. Good night. <laughs>